everyone, and welcome to the August 19th, 2019 Town of Essex Select Board meeting. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And thank you everyone for being here this evening. It's gonna be a warm evening. Our apologies for the lack of ventilation. Um, the agendas can be converted into fans. And they're dual purpose. All right, first order of business, agenda additions and changes. Greg, what do you have for us? Uh, two items and apologize for adding them now. We had uh, the day off on Friday, so packets went out a little bit earlier than normal on Thursday. Um, couple things, uh, the Energy Committee is seeking a, approval of a resolution in support of the Vermont Energy Investment Corporation's electric school bus pilot program participation. And also there's a reading file item um, for a letter going out to Tanglewood Drive residents uh, with some information about paving. Okay. And we have a public hearing scheduled to begin at 745 because that's already been warned for that time, we can't start that portion of the meeting any earlier. So what we're going to do is go through our business items and then when we get to 70, 745, we'll transition over to our public hearing. So thank you for your patience with that. Um, can I get a motion from a select board member to, for the amended agenda? I move we amend the agenda to add business item 6G, which is a resolution in support of the VEIC electric school bus pilot program. Second. I'll second. Thank you. All those in favor? Oh, excuse me, discussion, Andy. Is there a second thing that needs to be added? The 8H. Oh, you're right. 8H. Right, thank you. Can I amend that to say, and uh, item 8 H, which is the tangle with drive information. Annie, are you acceptable I to that? Accept it and keep my second. Any further discussion? All those in favor with the agenda amend up, uh, agenda, amended agenda, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Now we have public to be heard. This is the portion of the meeting where public members can speak to the board about items that are not on the agenda. Is there anyone here this evening who has something to say or share that is not on our agenda this evening? Sir, would you mind coming up to, there's a mic in the middle of the room. Thank you, Nils Giddens from Whitcomb Meadows Lane. Um, this is in the uh, category of um, um, safe, pedestrian, friendly community. Um, as you know there's been considerable expense um, uh, done to create three controlled pedestrian crossings of Allen Martin Road uh, near Route 15. Um, as it stands, those are now the, the very safest, um, um, most smooth areas of, of pedestrian walkway in, in that uh, corridor. Um, Allen Martin pedestrian trail along there is in a stad, sad state of affairs. Um, there is increasing business along Allen Martin off into both Corporate Drive and Thompson Drive. Green Mountain Transit has, um, has provided uh, two bus stops for the commuter line at Allen Martin and Route 15. And so my question for the select board, and I don't need an answer tonight, but I hope that it will receive some consideration, is with the expense on the pedestrian walkways, crossways, uh, can we expect better maintenance of the trail alongside, as well as all season use, as in um, snow clearance as well? Thank you. We'll look into that. Does anyone else have anything they want to share or say that is not on the agenda? All right, we're going to move on. Our first business item is an interview with Elizabeth Coleman, who wishes to be appointed to the Conservation and Trails Committee. Elizabeth, are you here? Would you mind coming up to the table, or if you feel better standing at the mic, whichever you prefer. 
<laughs> I don't know if this will help or not. <laughs> that would be helpful if you're a little further. <laughs> I'll lean forward. Thank you. So you're interested in becoming a member of the Conservation and Trails Committee. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and why you'd like to do that? Well, I've been a resident here off and on for six years, and I use all the trails and parks frequently. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks. Sorry. Thank you. And I've had an interest um, for a while. Uh, at one point, I was going to do the um, trail caretakers program, but I had a problem with my knee, so I had to bow out. And um, I, I just I want to contribute to the community. This is a little intimidating. Oh, please don't. We're all neighbors here. It's okay. okay. <laughs> so um, I guess that's mostly that's why. Great. That's great. <laughs> and now I'm I'm a retired nurse, so I have more free time. And I just thought it's a good way to contribute and get to know people. Absolutely. Does anybody else have any questions for Elizabeth? <coughs> Max? Yeah, hi, Elizabeth. Thank hi. you uh, for volunteering and stepping forward like this in our community. Um, so you have prior experience in Cambridge? On, I did. Uh, I was on the, work? yes. I, Are there things that you uh, saw that worked well there that you're hoping to be able to bring to, um, to Essex's uh, committee? It's been, I was on the conservation commission there, I think, in early 2000. And we were involved in creating a trail from the, the town center up to, um, partway up to Smugglers. It was a 6.2 6 mile trail. So that was mainly what our focus was during that time. I did become a little bit familiar with just how, how things in a smaller community work, but it's very different in Essex. <laughs> um, I am interested in, in the idea of linking all the parks, the park system and the trail system, because I think we have a really incredible resource here. And I'm hoping that whatever I do can help support people becoming more aware of it, taking better care of it, and having more respect for our resources. That's Good. really why. Good. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Any other board members have a question for Elizabeth? Pat? Um, so, Elizabeth, what's your favorite trail to walk in town? Like, Thompson. if I, good recommendation for me. I have, like, a kid who's, <laughs> okay. you know, okay. uh, going to be bringing a dog along with her. <laughs> What's well, the best in your recommendation? Um, I often walk on Foster Trail, you know, the Foster Park Trail yeah. behind the school. Um, but I've been mostly walking in Thompson, off Thompson Road trails this whole summer. I like them because they're flat. But... <laughs> You have to be very respectful and careful of the bikers. So, and I do walk my dog here. Awesome. But I'm somebody who always picks up after my dog. And I have <laughs> Thank a big you for dog. that. <laughs> so. Great, thanks. Anyone else? Andy, Annie? Mm -hmm. All right. So, um, first of all, there's a lot of ways you could spend your time as a retiree, and we're very grateful to you that you chose to apply to be a member of one of our committees. So, thank you for that. Um, Greg, there, are there any other applicants for this position? No. Okay. So sometimes when we have more than one applicant, we go into executive session and we have a sure. discussion, but we don't have a second applicant. And if it's the board's pleasure, perhaps we could move forward and um, take care of appointing someone to the committee today. Would that be sure. acceptable to all of you? Would anyone sure. like to make a motion? Sure. Andy, was that a hand up or? No, you were grabbing your pen. Okay. I, I'd, uh, Move that the select board appoint Elizabeth Coleman to the Conservation and Trails Committee. Is there a second? I'll second. Any second? Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Congratulations, you're our newest member. Thank you for allowing me to be nervous in front of you. Yeah. You did, you did well. I haven't did great. any meetings. So. <laughs> I will now. Uh, and keep in touch. Thank you so much. You'll be contacted. Okay, yes. What needs to happen next? Okay, thank you so much. Appreciate well, thank it. You. Thank you. Thanks very stay much. cool, because it's hot. <laughs> okay, thanks. Our next item Amy. of business. Amy. 
Pardon me? Oh, uh, may I take a moment? I'm having trouble with Wi-Fi, and I would like to use my, I'd like to turn my personal oh, Wi-Fi absolutely. on to connect, but I don't want anyone to think I'm on my phone for a reason. Oh, That's of course. <laughs> uh, and if you just need the password. I don't know. I can't get online, and I'm super nervous that all these forms that are right in front of me. Do you mind if I move on while you do No, as long as you all understand that I'm not disrespecting the process that's happening here. Thanks, Annie. So we're going to move on to 6B, which is the uh, Class 4 Road Maintenance Policy. Dennis Lutz is here to walk us through. Dennis Lutz, come on down. Thank you. Good evening, all. Hello. Hello. Hi, Dennis. This is a carryover from the meeting before where you adopted the road standards. Um, as you know, when you adopted those road standards, there were some changes that the state had made to include in um, some elements that deal with class four roads. And uh, I think at that meeting, one of the questions that came up, and I, I wanted to answer that first before I get into it, and I'm, hopefully this is a short answer, but um, there was a question about how many hydrologic, hydrologically connected road segments do we actually have? And if you include them all for gravel roads, class four roads, paved roads, curved roads, there's 799 wow. <laughs> Hydrologic, hydrologically connected road segments. Um, this is from Annie, and uh, I trust this explicitly. Um, the total number on gravel and class four roads is 370. So well, that's about half, give or take some. Um, when we went through and did an evaluation, started two years ago, went into last summer, we worked with the Regional Planning Commission and a consultant to try to identify which ones did we agree with the state's analysis and which ones did we disagree. So how many met the standard and how many did not? And essentially of that 370 gravel and class four road segments, 80 segments did not. That's about 20%, 21%. Um, over time, as part of our Stormwater, state stormwater permit for the community, we've got to bring those up to standard. Now, some of those are outfalls, some of those are ditches, some of those might be culverts and ditches, culverts, ditches, and outfalls. Um, last year, we've got, we got some money from the Regional Planning Commission, uh, a grant, uh, about $38,000 to do a portion, and we did uh, a portion of Brigham Hill Road that needed it. Um, we got another $38,000 this year, which we'll be working on this fall to utilize that money. Um, and we have about a 20-year window to correct these segments. Um, the dangerous thing about gravel roads is you look at it today and you look at it 20 years from now, and you may have a totally different list because they change. They're not like gravel roads that are kind of fixed in place. You have storms, you have events that occur. Uh, culverts get damaged. So it's kind of a moving target, but it gives us an idea of how many we have to do each year. Some of these we're going to do with road crews try to get them off that way. This does not include the village. Um, the village doesn't have gravel roads, but they still have hydrologically connected segments on paved roads. Um, I did not bring that with me because the discussion tonight is gravel roads and class four roads. So that's kind of background. Um, the other question might be in the eyes of the select board, um, how many class four roads do we actually have? Um, and we used to have eight, now we have seven. Uh, at one point in time, we considered the landfill access road a class four road, but since it's gated, the state no longer considers it as a class four road. It's just class three up to the gate, and beyond that, it's just access to the landfill. So it's no longer a class four roadway. But of those roads, there's only a couple that have any significant length. Um, and most of them, <clears throat> the, the real small ones, um, Brigham Hill Lane, there's 0.1 miles, 0.15. Um, extension of Saxon Hill Road, 0 0.08 miles. Water Tank Road, there's actually a class four road that leads to the CWD, used to be town, now CWD water tank off of Bixby Hill Road. That we may be at some point be able to get rid of just by working an arrangement with CWD since they're, it's their access, deed the land to them, get it off our class four roads. At that point, it's their road. Those roads have really never been issued, issues. Um, the larger ones that we've had issues with in the past has been 
um, Hanley Lane, the extension of Hanley Lane, um, West Sleepy Hollow Road, which actually goes from Old Pump Road all the way over to Route 128. And that's long, that's 1.95 miles. It's in three segments. There's an eastern portion of West Sleepy Hollow Road which has two houses on it and which is essentially a driveway within a class four roadway. There's a section that's still pucker brush. Um, you might be able to get a motorcycle through going real slow or an ATV, but you're not gonna drive a vehicle through. And then there's where most of the housing is developed, the West Sleepy Hollow Road portion that comes off of 128. So it's not, it's connected by virtue of right of way, but you can't drive it from one end to the other. And then the other one that we've dealt with occasionally um, is McGee Road. And McGee Road is a kind of a backdoor road that comes in to the backside of um, the park. Uh, and so it's an emergency access for us. So that's maybe a little longer winded than I wanted to be, but that gives you the background. So in our, in our ordinance on class four roads, the, the town has some statements in there which are consistent with state law. And 19 VSA basically says, class four roads are maintained only to the extent required by the necessity of the town, the public good, and the convenience of the inhabitants of the town. Essentially, we do not get any state aid for class four roads, and we can maintain them to the degree under state law that we want to maintain them, what the board wants to do. But in our municipal code, it states it's, it's the policy of the town that no improvements or maintenance will be made by the town to any class four road not currently being maintained as of the date of the adoption of the ordinance. That was 1992. This chapter is to ensure that the expense of upgrading these roads to accommodate additional development is not borne by the residents. So the policy that was established in 1992 was we're not gonna maintain class four roads. Now we have the, the road standards that said, well, there are some conditions that you have to do certain things on class four roads. And so to clarify this for the future, and this is not to get into any and all issues on class four roads. And I know there's some on West Sleepy Hollow that residents have brought up. That's not the point of this. The point of this is to establish what do we mean when we say maintenance on a class four road from the town's perspective. Um, and I didn't mention it, but I noticed on the agenda it says adoption. I think the plan of the board is it's not an adoption tonight. It's a presentation, discussion, and adoption comes at a subsequent meeting to allow people to have, to have input. That's the general procedure. But the way the policy is written, and I, I think you, you all have copies, you should have, um, a couple of them in the beginning, we just explain McGee Road was pre-existing. We've done some maintenance up there. There's a reason for it. It's a backdoor entrance to the park. It's an emergency access. Um, we've done that to keep that backdoor access open. Um, we don't do a lot of maintenance on it. We might go up there once every couple years, make sure it's still passable, and that's about it. Um, but that predates the 1992 ordinance. We were doing that prior to 1992. The landfill access road, although I've got it in here, is technically, at this point, having checked the state maps, is probably no longer a class four road, so we may wanna just take that whole thing out. But we do plow that for access to the solid waste district. Um, we have storage behind it that we use. Solid waste district uses it for the drop-off center. So we, we continue to do that. Um, West Sleepy Hollow Road, we try to define the situation on the major roads. Um, Basically, the class four portion, and that's the west side of West Sleepy Hollow Road, we feel is sufficiently constructed that we'll continue to uh, maintain winter plowing services. We've done that as the density of people has increased, um, along with all the other roads that we do plow. Um, but we did put a condition in the policy that says, provided that class four portion of the road is maintained to the extent that, it's, that is, it is traversable by plow trucks, school buses, and emergency vehicles, without damage to those vehicles caused by lack of road maintenance. We wanna be able to get up there and do our job and get back out. Um, and then there's a note in there about excluding the eastern portion, which I explained earlier. So the way we said that, the town's position is this. Given the new road standards, and this is the change what we've done in the past, and it's, it, it could be over the long run costly for the town, but we've decided to go this step. Um, the town will accept responsibility for replacing culverts and correcting erosion damage as required by the road and bridge standards, provided there's been supporting documentation, documentation that the road and the ditches have been maintained in accordance with those standards. What the standards talk about is if there's gully erosion, if it's really washed out. And what that really boils down to is 
Uh, you know, a few years ago, we had a major storm up there. It washed a lot of stuff out. In that time frame, Max might have been on the board. I'm not sure. But the decision was made that we would not put town funds into that road because of our policy, and the residents had to fix it. This essentially is a get-out-of-jail card that basically says if that were to occur again, we would fix it. But we also want to make sure that before we get to that point, the road is actually maintained by the people who live there, which they should be doing. Um, and this, so we would fix the culverts for both or replace them, cross-road culverts and driveway culverts. Um, we'll bring available, we'll use available funds because there's some hydrologically connected segments on different portions of class four roads. Um, if they don't meet the gravel road standards, we will use some of the money that we've been getting on our own resources to bring them up to that standard. We're not holding the associations or people who live on that road to a standard that doesn't exist. We want to bring them to a standard that says we now meet the town and road standard. That means putting stone in the ditch line, if it means ditching it, if it means replacing a broken culvert. We will do that as part of our cost to set up a, a beginning standard. Um, that also is consistent with what the board adopted last meeting at the, at the road standards. Um, so it's not only to meet the environmental requirements, but we want to better protect the road so that if a storm does come, then we don't have a huge expense in having to go out there and fix it because they've already done the work ahead of, ahead of storm events. And we found where we've done the stone lining and done the ditching, uh, places like Brigham Hill Road, places um, the far end of Brigham Hill Road, we've done enough work out there. We've gone through some pretty nasty storm events where other roads in town have washed out. Those have not. So the pretty clear if you do the work ahead of time, you can probably pre prevent a whole lot of problems and a whole lot of costs later on. Um, and then the last one is we'll require all new development on class four roads to meet the adopted road standards as well as the public work specifications. And we usually do that to the curb to explain what we need to have done. Um, from the property owner's perspective, and then we tried to define that so that it's a little better defined, the standard for maintenance should be that required to meet the town adopted state road and bridge standards and the town public works construction specifications, with the exception being width of road. The next paragraph is really it. Perform road grading, gravel addition, and maintenance of ditch, ditch lines. Those are three basic things to keep that, you know, once we brought them up to standard, the people who live along those roads and the association, wherever they may be, have a responsibility to basically clean the ditches add gravel if it needs it, and grade it. Um, so that, that kind of sets the standard for what our expectations are of them and what we're going to do. Um, we're also, like I say, right now, our plan on West Sleepy Hollow Road is to put, go in and do some of those stone drainage work at a cost of somewhere between twenty-five dollars and $30,000. So I know there's been questions about equity and inequity along that roadway, but we're going to dump a lot of money into bringing that road up to standard. It's the longest one we've got. And that's a significant contribution by the town to include culverts and to include that fail safe in case everything goes wrong down the road. Um, what we do want them to do also is report to the town any evidence of problems, gully erosion, culverts that are bad. Because if we don't know about it, we can't fix it. And so, or they can't fix it if it's a problem they've created. So we want to know what's going on there. And then what we asked is that every year, uh, around October 1st, we picked an arbitrary date. It could be any date, but before winter starts, some indication back from either the, by us traveling it and looking at it or the association coming back to us and saying, yes, we went out there, we graded it twice, we pitched 200 feet of road line, and we, we added four loads of gravel. And we'll look at it, and that's fine. We want to just make sure that there's a joint effort on those class four roads, that we're picking up the underlying problems, the greater responsibility, but we're not relieving, we're not abdicating all the responsibility under ordinance to say everybody else is home scot-free because that's not what they said in the beginning. So it's kind of that middle ground to try to find a balance between what we can do, what we should do under our permit, and what the residents need to do. And that's essentially it in a nutshell. And maybe that's longer than you wanted to have me go, but I, I wanted to summarize that because I think it's important that um, it is a delicate balance between the original document that said no maintenance now we've got drainage issues that we have to maintain. It's an attempt to do that. Dennis, thank you. Does anyone have any questions or comments for Dennis? Max. 
And is, is there any training that the town provides to the residents or the uh, association so they know what to look for, uh, you know, and when it's time to grade it or put some, you know, do the ditch work? Yeah, we've, we've, we've already done that, and we'd be willing to do that again. We did it on West Sleepy Hollow. We walked that whole roadway with the associ association president. I did it uh, to a certain degree along with Dan Gregoire, inspector pointed out where the road had to be fixed, where some ditching ought to be done. We looked at a bad culvert. Um, it, it's not a mutually exclusive, just go do your thing. But again, if they, if people call up and ask for assistance to have us come out and look, you know, if they feel, hey, there's a culvert that's a problem, give us a call, we'll go out and look at it, and then we'll make a judgment as to whether it's good or not, it's not good. So that offer is always there to, to help people. Um, in fact, we'd rather have them do that than step off and do something and find They've done it wrong. Right. Thank you. Huh? Uh, Dennis, uh, apologies if I'm misremembering this. Um, I'm trying to remember from some of the documentation from our previous meeting. There was an email in there that you had sent seeking some clarification about FEMA funds that we yes. might be able to get. By doing this, would that bring us in compliance so that if there was an event that we would be able to get those funds to address some of those roads? or? Again, apologies, because I remember no, it's a, the... It's a good, it's a good yeah. question. It's a, it's a question for which there's no good answer. Um, VTRANS was not going to step off and give us an answer and say, oh, yeah, now you're going to be covered. Um, I th what's going to happen on all those is it's going to have to be a judgment at the time. And one of the questions that, that VTRANS or that FEMA might have would be a road washes out. And that they've changed a little bit from the past because now they've been providing funds for remedies and for all kinds of things. So now the question that FEMA raises initially on is, well, what's the town done prior to the event? Um, if we have, for example, taken the money from the Regional Planning Commission, stone line ditches, and do, other, do the best we can, and it washes out, that's at least evidence you can provide to FEMA to say, we've taken grants, town money, and put it into the Class 4 road. So therefore, if that major event occurs, or even on any other gravel road, there's evidence that we've done it. And that's, that's financial evidence, that's pictures we take and we get done. You know, you store those things away and hopefully you don't have a FEMA event. But you would have to, you'd have to make the case to FEMA that the town has actively participated in making sure that road didn't wash out. Then you might, you might get funds. Um, FEMA nationally is hurting for money and you know, if they can find a way to not fund this and not fund that, I'm not, faulting them, it's just the way it is. Um, and if there's a gray area, they may not fund it. Okay. All right, thank you. Anybody else? Andy. Is there a, is there a path to full citizenship, you know, becoming a class three road? Or is that, <laughs> that not, that's not, a not diffi really the intent? Or what's no, the that's a difficult part of the ordinance. And I know that's, that's come up a lot of times. Um, and West Sleepy Hollow is a good example because there's a lot more houses on it than originally. Originally there was a couple, now there's more than a couple. Um, so, and there may be more. I mean, there may be a few more houses that develop up there. So the question, it's a very good question. The policy basically says the town is not going to accept any new gravel roads. Okay. okay. That's, I shouldn't say policy. That's in the ordinance. Okay. So the question really becomes one of, if you look at all our class four roads, um, you would almost have to go back and either amend the ordinance I don't think the intent of the town is to allow development to come off those gravel roads that's more gravel roads. That's always been my concern, is we've already got 23 miles. We do not have the funds to go out and pave them. They're about a million, million plus dollars a mile if you're gonna reconstruct and pave them. We don't have $23 million to go out and pave all our gravel roads. Over time, you could pick away at the ones that have the most traffic and maybe do that, but you're just not gonna do that. So why in the world would the town say, we're gonna allow developers to come in and add 10 more houses and put it on a gravel road, and now we go to 24, 25, 26. You bury yourself. So I think there's that provision of not enabling or allowing more gravel roads needs to remain. The question is, is there something unique about these old class four roads that at some point you could say the density is enough to make them, take them over short of paving them? We've kind of gone under the position that if you want to take them, you want us to take them over, pay them. That may not be practical for the future, 
and I think you almost have to deal with each road on a case-by-case -case basis. And the truth of the matter is when you look at the list, there may be only, at this particular point, one which falls into that category, which is what's Sleepy Hollow. Close in terms of density. But you'd have to look at that in terms of, okay, this is one. There may be two others down the road, Hanley Lane and McGee Road. If they were to develop, more people lived on them, other things happen. Are you going to, again, wave the policy and say, we'll take them over? Um, West Sleepy Hollow is in great shape. It's a, it's a good road. In fact, it's probably in better, it's narrow, but it's probably in better shape than some of the class three roads we have. So it's a good discussion, but I, I don't think it's part of this discussion. This discussion should be, what are we going to establish for the maintenance between residents and town? And that should be the limit of it. And those other discussions, I think, should come back another day. That's just my opinion. Any other questions for Dennis? Dennis, the policy, the documents you gave us for this topic um, refer to section 9.02.030. So we're, are you asking us to adopt policy without changing the ordinance? Yes. Or, okay, so yeah. we're not changing the, the ordinance. ordinance. I think the way it's worded, worded says we are not going to perform maintenance on gravel roads. And I think, again, you go back to the statute, I think we're allowed to do that. But we've now got the road standards that I think we have to, the question really becomes, what do you mean by maintenance? It's really the definition of how much maintenance you're actually going to do. I think it's a better way to go at this point than to go back in and change the ordinance and take that out and try and explain the ordinance, what you mean by maintenance. And we've done that once before. We had a policy change to the, to the policy back probably 10 years ago. Not on this topic, but on another part of it. Do you feel that the ordinance in its entirety is, is solid and does it need a look at because we're just talking about this one portion of it and tweaking policy to support it but when was the last time the public works looked at the ordinance the ordinance itself and decided whether there might need to be updates and has the select years. board I'm sorry probably 20 years okay. is that something that we can go back I don't think there's a lot in it that changes um, that would need to change but it could and it may be I mean, I'd like to get this on the ground so that if a month from now we have a storm event, everybody knows kind of what the ground rules are, um, and also to help the residents who live along the roads, because it, this is a, in my view, it's kind of like a big insurance policy, to be honest right, with you. Right, right. Um, but I think if we get this done, then I think we can review the ordinance, and if at some point in time there's some other things in there, we take this and wrap it into it in some way, shape, or form. Okay. So I think um, unless Greg or Evan um, what we usually do with this kind of thing is we accept mm -hmm. your um, description and we move, we adopt at a future meeting. Yes. So I do see one hand from the audience. If you have some brief, very brief comments to make, I'd be happy to invite you to the microphone, but please keep them very brief. Dennis, thank yep. you. Hi, I'm Lisa LaBerge. I live on West Sleepy Hollow Road. Um, just a couple of things. I would like some, there's some things I like clarified in here um, from the documentation. Um, the McGee, uh, Dennis mentioned the Big McGee and Landfill Roads. That was going to be one of my questions because I couldn't find any documentation that the town was maintaining those, but he specified that one is a class three road now. Um, uh, paragraph one of this um, states that the Indian Brook Road is heavily used. The McGee Road to Indian Brook is heavily used. It's an emergency access is warranted, and that's why they're maintaining that road. Um, and I just want to make a statement that there are 17 people that live on West Sleepy Hollow Road, and I think emergency access is warranted for all the people that live on that road also. And I think moving forward that this will help with that. That's a great idea. Um, one thing I'd like to, I'm a little concerned about is um, the emergency access and if a fire truck can currently get up the road right now. Um, a section of this mentions that if emergency vehicles are damaged, getting up the road, but I watched a school bus and a, construct, a truck um, that was doing some work on the road try to pass each other and they weren't able to. And then the truck had, um, the guy had to get up because it was damaged the trees at the top of it. And I don't believe it's as tall as one of the fire trucks. 
and I think it'd be great if we could address that before we say that the residents are responsible for any damage to emergency vehicles, um, just to make sure that right now they can go up there, because I'm not sure that they can without having issues because of the height of the road. Um, and that was a really interesting thing to see. Um, the, I'd like some clarification about the publicly owned section of the road and how that's gonna work. The town owns around 600 uh, feet of footage on the road, so who maintains that? Um, I've spoken to some contractors and they say, well, you only want me to do half the road? That's kind of, they kind of look at me like, really? Um, that's a really weird request and how do we manage that? Um, when we're doing the public section of the road and are we asking the residents to maintain the public road? And I think that's not on here. And it was, there was something about public on the last version of this, it mentioned that and I think it was removed and somehow that needs to be clarified. Who's gonna maintain the town road frontage in here and how do we manage that? Um, question about um, some of the documentation requirements. Um, the residents of the road are required to provide documentation, to make a report, and the question I got from um, someone else who's in the business was, what legal authority, and do, does the select board have the legal authority to require the town, residents on the road to, to provide documentation on whether the road's maintained on a regular basis? Can you, like, this is a public road, can you do that? weren't sure that was possible after looking at the Vermont state statutes and the Constitution. So what is the authority you have to ask us to provide reporting on a public road? And then what happens when someone doesn't do it? So there's um, all of these requirements are in here, but there's very little about what happens when someone doesn't do their share on the road. Who's responsible? What's the consequence? What's, what's supposed to happen with that? Um, <clears throat> Also, I'd like to have um, it be really clear when we're talking about the standards, what standards we're referring to, because the class four standards from the stormwater permit are just gullies. It does not have the same standards as a class three road, and it's very different. And so um, I would like to be really clear, if I have to be responsible for maintaining the road exactly, what standard, what is that called, what is that policy, um, so I can know what I'm doing. Um, and I will say that um, Dennis did walk me up and down the road to look at the road, but I'm gonna tell you I am not an expert and that didn't make me an expert on gullies and ditches and the requirements necessary. It was great that he walked me up, but you have a town engineer, someone with a degree that does that. And I think more training would absolutely be necessary to determine what is deficient and what is not. I don't think I'm qualified to do that. Um, There's also some confusion about um, who is responsible for maintenance on the road and it doesn't address this. In the past, some residents on the road have said, we don't have to do it because of a Burnett Town Highway Agreement. Well, I got a copy of that and that agreement does state that every, they're responsible for maintenance. And so what happens if those individuals further down the road choose not to maintain their section of the road and do their part and make their report? What is the, how do we as residents that live further up the road What's our process for, for making sure that they do their part so that we can have the school buses reach the children that live at the end of, other end of the road? How does that, I know this is about the maintenance, but I'm thinking what do we do and how do we make sure that we get the road at the um, beginning done because those people have not been doing their share. Um, and so that's a challenge. Um, I'd like if we adopt a policy like this that we have some type of inspection of the road um, Dennis says it's in good shape, and I think it is, but the mailman told me it's the worst road on his route, and that it was worse than Osgood Hill Road. Now that's, you know, not evidence of anything, but I'm not sure that it's at standard right now. So if it's not quite at standard, are we responsible for bringing it up to standard? Um, I know that there's 17 homes on the road, and it never got improved or developed to the level because of a lot of issues that happened over the years. We can't fix that. Um, I just want to say that I've been working on getting the road maintained, and I'd like to express the challenge it is. Um, right now, I've got I've made 15 calls to different contractors to maintain the road. Finding someone who can come up and grade a mile-long road is challenging because they need a big grader. And I've had five people with a grader that size say, "I can't do it. It's not worth my time." 
Um, I have someone right now who's looking into bringing more gravel into the road who says he can't find the gravel that meets the town standards because they're very specific. And so that's a challenge. So even if we, when we make our best efforts to have someone come in and do the work, it's actually pretty hard to have someone come and maintain a mile long road because usually class four roads are short and you can find someone to come into a short section of the road. It's, it's pretty hard. Um, and I spend a lot of time trying to work with contractors and get someone um, to do that work. So I'd like you to take that into consideration when you're thinking about rewriting this policy. Thank you very much for the comments. We really appreciate it, Lisa. Okay. Yes, thank you. So we've gotten through two business items, but we are now at 7.45, which is the warned time for the start of our public hearing on the firearms discharge ordinance. I got a motion. Want to just do a motion on that one? Yes. That's, yeah, we'll wrap that up. So we are looking for a motion to accept the revised policy on Class 4 roads. Would anyone like to make a motion? Andy? I make a motion that the select board accept the recommended policy on maintenance of class four roads with any changes as modified after public input for adoption at a future meeting. Is there a second? Second. Is there any further discussion? All right, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, thank you. Okay, we're gonna transition now to talk about the firearms discharge ordinance. Every time this topic comes up, there are new faces in the audience. So I appreciate everyone's willingness to be here. Those of you who have been here through the whole time and those of you who are joining us for the first or second time tonight and for those of you who are watching at home. Um, the process is this is a public hearing and so the select board will <coughs> listen to public comment and the public comment will be on the amended ordinance in its entirety, including the discussions about the locations of the discharge, um, allowed discharge, the dates of allowable discharge, and the proposed shooting range regulations. So um, I'm gonna just give a quick overview of where we've been for those of you who haven't joined us before. Um, this is a continuation and the final step in the select board's process on revising our public, excuse me, our firearms discharge ordinance. We have received so much input from the community and we thank you for that. We've had multiple public forums. We had a facilitator um, work with the community on providing input. We had an online forum where we received input. We've had multiple select board hearings where dozens of people have come and provided their feedback. We have all received multiple emails. We've taken private meetings with individual residents. We've had a lot of outreach and we really appreciate the intensity and the engagement, the level of engagement we've gotten from the community on this. And we have been listening. We have heard you. Um, we also have the 2009 report from the Firearms Task Force, recommendations from three different Essex police chiefs and legal opinions from the town attorney we realize that this is a topic that um, emotions run very deep on in our community. And we know that this whole conversation has been appreciating for people to watch in terms of watching the select board grapple with the topics and what seems like obvious solutions and what seems like obvious things we shouldn't be doing. We are balancing a lot of needs, a lot of traditions, and a lot of personal philosophies. So we are, above all, trying to do the best we can for the safety of the community while protecting the traditions of the community as well. So we are going to um, have a hearing now. Once the public has spoken, we will close the public hearing portion. At that point, the conversation will come back to the board and we will discuss amongst ourselves the amended ordinance. If we choose to make changes to the amended ordinance as it stands today, then we cannot pass it today. If we do choose to make changes to the ordinance, we will have to start the public hearing process over, and I believe it would be September 23rd would be the next select board meeting where it would come back up. We would warn it again as another public hearing with a newly amended ordinance. But if we, the board decides tonight that they do not wish to make any further changes to the ordinance, then we will vote on its passage and its implementation tonight. 
Therefore, oh, and after on our agenda, we also have a business item to discuss the notification form for shooting ranges that we're proposing. The notification form itself is not part of the ordinance. It, the ordinance dictates that there would be a form, but the contents of the form are not part of the ordinance. So we can continue to discuss that separately from the vote on the ordinance. So I want everyone to realize that there's two different discussions that are going to happen this evening. So I would like to ask all of you, before we get started, for a show of hands, who wishes to speak? And keep your hands up. Okay, there's quite a few, and we're, we really appreciate that, and we're gonna try to get everyone in. <coughs> because there's so many, we're going to have to time you, so everyone can have a minute, 30 seconds to share what they need to share. When you come to the microphone, state your name, and when you have something to say, please try to keep it to information that we have not already heard. There's a lot of information we have talked about over and over again. If you agree with someone who has already spoken, instead of restating what they've said, just say that you agree with them, please, for time's sake. We will time you, and we will let you know if your time is up. And um, you might have seen it before, I'm gonna be strict with you. If your time is up and you keep going, I'm cutting you off. Um, we have a lot of people in the audience. It's very warm in here. Please be respectful of your neighbor's opinions and let's get started with discussions. If you want to come talk, the microphone is at the center of the room. You can form a line. It might be easier to form a line and quicker. And folks, we're gonna, there's so many people who wanna speak. Um, you're gonna get to speak one time. And at the end of the line, if I see, I'm gonna give you an option. Anybody else who hasn't spoken yet, I'm gonna give you one last chance but um, I appreciate your patience with this process, and you're up. Hello, Eric Bailey, Wilkinson Drive, Essex. Currently, the, the ordinance has Indian Brook shooting period starting in November 1. Starting in the autumn of 2020, the firearms rules, fire, the hunting rules will change where the youth season will always be in late October, as early as 20 October. And the early muzzleloader season, which is targeting antlerless deer, which is how you manage the herd, will be as early as 24 October. I implore the board to consider moving that date to 20 October to cover both the youth season, which is any deer and is good for management, and the season that is set out for management. You know, the uh, Ethan Trapper, who did the forest management plan for Indian Brook, was very clear about the detriment the deer have on the understory. Uh, I, could, I could read his full quote, but I think you've seen it. Okay, the, the Northern Heritage um, Element Inventory and Assessment for the town also, you know, emphasizes that, you know, the hunting in, in the forest in Essex being a, um, a valued asset. 20 seconds. All right, I just, like I said, that's, that's the key of what I wanted to do is get us, you know, get those hunting seasons into it because the deer are taking away the, I mean, we're getting a monoculture forest because they're, they're eating the small oaks and maples and such, and we have a monoculture of, this, of the less valuable trees. Thank you. Thank you. Before I start, I have a procedural question. Can I give you a prepared statement? If I run out of time, you'll have it in your possession. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Just for the audience, we don't start the clock while you're doing your name and your address. That's official, but you don't get to use that time. To <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> but please. State your name and your address clearly. Hello. Go. <laughs> My name is Mike Pelletier. I live on 69 Greenfield Road in Essex. I moved to Essex in 89. I moved to Heinsburg and I moved back. Uh, I've seen a lot of changes in Essex and I understand that the, this town's firearms ordinance is emotional and uh, I think it's good to have a formal plan but I have concerns about what you didn't include in the plan. Uh, specifically about certifying that each 
shooting facility is designed to contain the bullet shot or other firearms. It is unclear what the criteria or basis is for certifying this facility in this regard. Previous uh, meetings have referenced the NRA range manual. I read the manual almost in entirety, and that is for um, uh, American Trap Association fields, National Skeet Shooting uh, fields, and many other organizations are represented in there too. But these requirements are for sanctions national or Olympic level events. It's, it's out of character to compare them against a backyard facility. It's, it's not appropriate. Uh, they have standards for distances for equipment, which fling the clay pigeons, the level of flatness, it's all automated equipment, uh, requiring a, a local homeowner to comply with those standards is onerous. It's really not fair. Okay. OSHA allows sole proprietorships to be exempt from their rules if conditions are met, including not being a general contractor, not having subs, employees, or whatnot. Can the town follow the precedent set by OSHA, a safety organization that allows common sense rules for commercial enterprises versus a different individual or mom and pop uh, rule? Time. I encourage you to delay and amend this ordinance to remove any Thank ambiguity. You, Mr. Pelletier. Hi, um, my name is Mia Watson. I live at 8 South Street in the village. Um, I'm the granddaughter of John Rice. And for the few here who don't know, um, my grandfather died 11 years ago when his neighbor shot a bullet through my grandparents' window uh, while well, he was target shooting with an SKS semi-automatic rifle. My grandfather died at his own uh, dining room table while my grandmother watched it happen to him. On behalf of my entire family, I'd like to thank, extend our thanks to the select board for working towards these basic safety reforms. Um, I know this was a really difficult decision and it really did take a lot of courage to move forward in the face of opposition. But this action is long overdue. I was 18 years old and starting my first year of college when my grandfather died. I'm now 29 and we're just now doing something to try to prevent this tragedy from happening again. The reforms proposed by the select board are extremely moderate. It's not unreasonable for the town to manage basic safety concerns in backyard firing ranges. It's not unreasonable for joggers and hikers to be able to use our parks and woodlands for most of the year without worrying that they will be shot. These proposals are less sweeping than what former police chief Brad LaRose recommended. For anyone here who is here tonight to oppose this measure, you are benefiting from a compromise. I and many other Essex residents wish that the select board had gone further. 15. I doubt what I'm saying tonight is going to change anyone's mind. If you're opposed to moderate gun control, you can easily dismiss my arguments as the emotional perspective of someone who is grieving. But to the select board and everyone else here, I and many other residents of this town have rights as well, and we believe that we deserve the chance to live here without worrying that we'll be shot by a stray bullet. Thank you. Hi, Mike Katie on uh, Lost Nation Road, and I want to specifically address just the registration or public listing of ranges. Uh, unfortunately, in today's world, uh, it doesn't take much information to increase one's risk uh, to a whole host of bad things, uh, and I've seen that firsthand a lot just with my job. Uh, the specific listing of people's names, addresses, and tying that to a specific hobby uh, or thing they do, in this case, shooting ranges, uh, potentially opens them up to increased risk to them, their family, and uh, the property that they have. And in no way am I trying to, unfortunately, ma'am, I'm following you and I'm sorry about this, not trying to say that kind of risk, but uh, what that does open up to is targeted theft. People know there's firearms in the house, they have value. It opens it up to maybe anti-gun vandalism or attacks, et cetera. Take this one step further, what if we're talking about making people register who have ride dirt bikes on their land? Same thing, people now know they have dirt bikes at their house, et cetera, and that could be even just anti-dirt bike behavior because there's people that don't like motorized vehicles on the land. The point is that's not any of your intention, and I know that, but to ignore that increased risk to those people is to also be naive to the reality of the world we live in. So we're here for safety tonight, and we're all about safety, but let's consider everybody's safety in this fact and consider is there a way to maybe not have this publicly available information to make it harder for those people who wish to do others harm and violate the law uh, to hurt seconds. people? Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Daryl Stoltz, 11 Seneca Avenue, Essex Junction. I am just here to express support for the ordinance changes as written. Thank you.
Sarah Michelle Stoltz, 11 Seneca Avenue. I am also here to express um, my support for these measures, um, especially based on our changes of density and population. And I want to thank you for your courage to address these issues. Thank you. My name is Ron Redmond. I live at 18 Vale Drive in Essex Junction. I want to thank you for your courage for doing this. Um, I love that you have respected hunters. And during hunting season, I spend a lot of time at Indian Brook. Hunting season, I just don't go. Um, but I want to go all the other times. I spend a lot of time there, winter, spring, summer, fall. It's a great resource. My three children have enjoyed it. And uh, I think what you have here is a great compromise. And I encourage you to, to steam ahead. Thank you. Uh, Ed Wilbur, Browns River Road. Uh, I would just like to point out that the uh, tragic death of Professor Reese in 2008 was compounded uh, by an even more tragic outcome of the trial in which the total jail time for the two convicted totaled less than two and a quarter years. That's less time than you'd get for a second offense for drugs in Arkansas. I'd also like to point out that uh, in that same time since the tragedy, rather than making an effort to educate residents about gun safety and encourage people to have uh, uh, civil discourse, we've continued to spend tax dollars on uh, surveys and uh, focus groups, um, which is doing absolutely nothing towards uh, educating uh, the general public. I'd also like to point out um, that in the case of Brian Murphy, uh, where his neighbor negligently discharges weapons towards his home. Uh, I find it sad that the, uh, the only thing that the uh, police can do is recommend that we take all of our gun rights away. Um, I'd say in a free society, uh, until we commit an act of violence against someone else, it's basic common sense. Um, 30 seconds. That gets lost in a frightened democracy. Um, I'd also like to point out that the uh, two ordinances which you guys have cited and used uh, as your staff uh, has looked into, um, specifically are for businesses. They are for, for profit uh, and strictly say so in them. Um, the, the ordinances uh, uh, specifically say that they are for outdoor shooting ranges, uh, for uh, shooting for a fee or remuneration. And uh, the second ordinance that you guys cite, um, it also says that it uh, specifically does not apply to uh, casual target shooting on Thank private you, property. Thank you. <clears throat> Nils Giddens, Whitcomb Meadows Lane, Town of Essex. Thank you for the emailed answers to my questions about proposed shooting in the Saxon Hill school parcel posed at the last meeting. I note that is duly recorded in this meeting's background materials. Despite the fact you are committed to appropriate signage during the six weeks in question, I remain concerned about the safety of this policy. We've heard it all. Anyone shooting needs to know their backstop. And in the various nooks and crannies adjacent to this particular parcel, the Deer Crossing neighborhood and the recreational Saxon Hill forest lands, I would submit this is quite difficult. If you're committed to seasonal signage, you could also choose to be committed to permanent signage in fact, likely reducing the shooting in the entire immediate area. This is not extending the restricted area to private property. This is adding to the safety of the whole community that I believe should be the select board's primary goal. Now, I know the problems that expanding deer populations pose to forest management, but whether this additional 90 acres for recreational hunting would make seconds. a significant difference is debatable, especially when professional programs may need consideration for truly effective control. In closing, I must also raise the subject of more general signage, namely the lack of any mention how those entering the firearms restricted areas would know it. This was an area that the Firearms Discharge Ordinance Committee, of which I was a member, felt had been sorely lacking and one that needs to be addressed no matter what final policy is adopted. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm Bruce Post, a resident of 1 Cindy Lane. Uh, I was elected to the select board in 2009, and one of the first things I did was ask Brad Rose to take me up to the Rice residence, because I wanted to see what happened. John Rice just sat down for a cheeseburger. When that tumbling bullet ricocheting off a rock came in, and the last words he said were, oh no, 
When we took up the ordinance, or at least our research, I think in 2009 and commissioned a committee, um, I looked at some of the discussion threads and somebody said a gunshot is the sound of freedom. Well, to John and Sheila Rice that night, it wasn't the sound of freedom that they might have heard, it was the sound of death. And that's the reality. So even if you're taking baby steps towards this goal, can take them, do something. It has been too long. Thank you. Richard Smiles, Locust Lane, Essex Junction. I want to thank you, Select Board, for the work you've done. I know it's been hard work. I appreciate the compromise. I speak simply in support of the revisions that you are proposing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Could I ask one point of clarification just quickly? So this isn't the time to address the, the uh, form, the notification no, form? No, that'll be after this. Okay, that changes what I'm gonna say, but okay. <laughs> so uh, Ben Bro, my family owns land on Lost Nation Road. Uh, first of all, I think it's very irresponsible to put in an ordinance referencing a form and then not have decided what the form's gonna be because that can change what people feel about the ordinance. Um, so my family owns land uh, and it's uh, no dwelling on it. It's legally posted. Um, we've always allowed anyone that asked to come across it to you know, do any kind of recreation that they want. The snowmobiles can go through it, biking, hiking. I've also been sitting in my tree stand and have people come through um, walking dogs and bicycles during hunting season. Um, and I've never, you know, prosecuted against them or anything because posting isn't just for hunters. It's, it's against trespassing on, on your land. And we do that because our recreation is shooting and hunting there and we want to know who's on it. And, um, I just feel like, um, what other form of recreation on your own personal property does this municipality require, require people to jump through these hoops and have to fill out notification forms and liability insurance. And um, I think that that's unfair just because my form of recreation deals with firearms. And if this goes through, then we are probably not allowing any, uh, any recreation on our land because we can't do the recreation we want to do. Brad Kennison, uh, Bixby Hill Road. The discussion over firearms usage has been educational for all involved in this process. As shooting sports enthusiasts, we need to embrace safety at all times and be mindful of neighbors' rights. On the flip side, for those who do not shoot nor understand guns, we need to understand our rights and that a gunshot does not, equal, you know, not equate to danger. Shooting can be done anywhere as long as it is done safely. Last fall, the former chair revealed his agenda to infringe on the residents' ta taxpayer property rights, justifying its necessity under the guise to protect the public welfare. At that point, it became very clear this was an anti-gun personal bias aimed at minimizing the use of firearms in our community. This is further evidenced by the no notification form and its onerous restrictions. Isn't it ironic that guns that the select board is attempting to minimize the use of a, at a private range can be used to hunt with on the same property? Once again, we as residents, taxpayers, and shooting sports enthusiasts call on the select board to abandon this misguided agenda, vote to eliminate the notification form and its restrictions, and adopt an ordinance with shooting restrictions in the town park and a voluntary notification. This would be a show of wisdom and restraint. It's time to cease creating division in our community and instead bring people together. Ten seconds. The town, excuse me? Oh, the town charter allows for voters to, uh, to force an Australian ballot vote by petition. The petition to obtain those signatures will begin tonight. We'll meet in the lobby after this um, meeting if you, the Brad. board votes affirmatively. Thank you. Gene White Jr., Maplewood Lane in the village. I'm here to voice my support for the changes that you're proposed that have been proposed to the firearms issue for the sake of public safety. Thank you. Thank you. 
Sean McEwen, 21, Turnberry Red, Jessex. <clears throat> I was on the, an alternate on that board, and it's interesting that one thing that we said was an issue, and nobody cares about it now even, was signage. You got places where you can't shoot now. People from, that don't live in this town don't even know where those are. The other thing is we got property that's been in my family since 1920s. I have a hard time having to take out extra insurance so that I can target shoot to get my gun ready for the seasons, test some ammo out that I loaded. That's not palatable to me when it's not a range that I'm there shooting at every day. And I don't know if it's palatable to anybody. The other thing is we got signs up on the property that say no trespassing. And I'll have people come on. I like the idea of signing signage around where we're going to have a range because I can't keep the people off anyway. And then when I ask them, did you see the sign? I get a comment from the lady, oh, what are you hiding? That doesn't sit well with me. I don't know. Maybe the only thing is to keep everybody off, snowmobilers, everything. And then I don't have to worry about anybody being on the property. And if somebody hears a shot, I don't know where it came from. It wasn't me. Good evening. Yeah, I'm Mitch Allen. I live on Lost Nation Road. Um, many of us in town, uh, like myself, moved here over 40 years ago from Burlington area, specifically to have land that we can enjoy when we pay taxes on. And I've done that for, four, I personally have done that for 40 something years in my yard. I picked a lot with a 100 yard, 100 foot high background. Um, there hasn't been an incident in that period. Uh, a lot of this fear is being driven by the media hype and, and just agitating the public who really is not familiar with firearms and shooting. Um, in, in reality, accidental shootings and crime both have fallen at least by half in the last 25 years. If you listen to the media, you'd think it's accelerating, increasing, and getting worse. Not seconds. the case. 30 seconds. Pardon? 30, 30 seconds. seconds. Um, uh, I, I just, I fear that having licenses and registering your sh backyard, especially just for casual use or occasional use, opens up if, if, it's, if you have to do that, you might as well say all of Essex is closed to shooting for, for private recreation, recreation. because uh, will the fees increase and the requirements get out of hand? Your time so, is up. Thank, thank you. you. John Demerit, 58 Brigham Hill Road. I'm here in opposition to newly uh, changes of, of the ordinance. Um, things have gone through the hunting season since 76 when we bought land in Essex and we are backed up to Indian Brook Reservoir property. And uh, in fact, as a kid, as children, myself and my friends built most of those chair, trail systems that are now currently used. We've uh, put no trespassing signs and posted signs on our property. People blatantly disregard that. And I'm not sure that if this ordinance gets passed that anybody is going to respect any firearm signs as well as they don't respect any trespassing signs or no trespassing signs. There are safety signs, safety zone signs that have been in effect for I don't know how many years. In this particular case with this young lady, I'm very sorry. That was a blatant disregard of proper, adequate uh, shooting range situation. It should have never happened, and I'm very apologetic for that. 30 seconds. As owners of 100 acres, I'm not sure that we pay a, a bunch of tax in Essex, and I'm not sure that it's fair that somebody can control what we do on privately owned property when we own that much acreage. I understand a shooting zone around parks. I can get that, but I think it's a little overboard the rest of what you're uh, trying to pass through. That's it, thanks. Thank you.
Betsy Dunn to Cindy Lane. Um, I appreciate the work you're doing, and I agree that with uh, anything that's around a reaction, uh, recreational area should have tighter um, rules around guns. But I also agree that we should have synergy around because I think that it brings it forward. People see that and they remember it. You know, um, please listen to that. Thank you. I'm Jim Weston I'm from 175 Towers Road Extension. Uh, the reason I'm here tonight um, is because you guys got a very important decision to make. Um, and I believe there was some uh, misleading information uh, that I have shot toward the neighbor's Murphy's house directly from mine. And I just want to clarify that I have never shot toward his house. Um, I've been there since 1979. Uh, and my grandson and I sight our guns in every year. We shoot into a dirt pile that's 250 to 500 yards, um, not even remotely close in the angle of shooting toward the Murphys. And I would like to invite the board or the you folks up to look at the property so you can see that it is a safe, because I think such a important decision should be made on true facts, not things that were misled a little bit. Um, and if I had done something wrong, I would have thought that the police or the select board or somebody would have come and said I'm doing something wrong and I've never heard it. I have had um, discussions with the neighbors, with Mr. Murphy and with one of the other gentlemen. Um, and because of that, I make sure they bring in more material in and I'm moving where I shoot uh, further uh, down the road so it won't even be near anybody. And I just want to know that everything is safe and I, you know, we've done nothing wrong there. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, I'm John Bourbon. I live on 348 Browns River Road, otherwise known as one, Route 128. My house is perched on the edge of a floodplain. There's never going to be any development back there. I've been shooting there successfully and safely since 1988. I got a backstop, I got no issues, and I'm unequivocally opposed to this ordinance and all of the requirements for range that you folks have laid out as being the desirable attributes. Thank you. Uh, good evening, my name is Chris Adams. I also live on Browns River Road. Um, as has been mentioned, I'm very concerned. I oppose these uh, proposed uh, changes. I'm very concerned about unintended consequences. My wife and I enjoy the shooting sports. We shoot on our property in a safe and respectful manner to our neighbors. We do so infrequently in requiring us to identify, document with the town, that we now have a shooting range on our property, I believe could have significant unintended consequences and I encourage the board to think through that very, very clearly. Um, you don't know what sort of chain reaction those sorts of lists could generate. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Brian Sheldon, 115 Jericho Road. Um, one of the things I like to say is that Essex has everything. You know, we have um, the biggest tech employer in the, in the country, and Max and I run some of the smallest tech employers in the, in the state, right? Um, so similarly, so, so therefore I support this ordinance because you can't do everything everywhere. So it, um, it, 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 it limits where you, where you can and where you can't um, use firearms. I'm especially encouraged by, um, um, given my work on the Saxon Hill Advisor Committee, that the, um, the school district owned portion was extended to um, be the no shooting zone. We heard a lot about that. Um, there's one thing that I have heard tonight on, from both sides, which is that, um, yeah, how do you know, I mean, where, how do you know where the different portions um, start? So I think um, whether you support or don't support this ordinance, I think um, we could do with some better signage. So not just for firearms as well as for Saxon Hill. So thank you for your time. Hi, my name is Lee Beauregard. I live in the village, so I don't have a range. I can't have a range. But one thing that does concern me is that the information that you've taken as a basis, or it appears that you've taken as a basis for the ordinance, seems to be coming 
from a document or documents that refer to shooting range facilities. And those are, I've looked at 26 different ordinances from North Carolina, Texas, Montana, Maine, Virginia. All of them talk about the facility being a commercial facility. And 24 of the 26 specifically say does not include incidental target practice on private property. The other two, if you look in the notes to the, whatever their equivalent is of a select board, to talk about specifically excluding firing ranges on, or shooting ranges on private property. And I'd like you to consider that, that you seem to be comparing apples and oranges or taking an ordinance that is for a commercial property and trying to put it into private property. Thank you. Uh, Brian Murphy, 187 Towers Road. Uh, the first thing I'm going to say is in 90 seconds, I'm not going to have any discussion about my particular property. I will simply say to Jim, who I have a lot of respect for when we talk, it's all on tape. That's the beauty of these meetings. You can listen to everything I said, and I'll stand behind everything I said. Uh, what I will indicate to you know, I don't want to have a neighborly discussion here, but sometimes the landowner is not there, and that was one of the things on the notification form, is you have guests on your property, you're not even aware of what's going on when you're gone. And that was one of the incidents when there was an AR-15 and there, was no, there were guests there. And that's why um, there's problems. Uh, so I encourage anyone to um, talk to me, sidebar on this, and uh, I'll go over it. Uh, I, I think all my statements have been entirely accurate and they're all on the record. Mark Redman, 11 Marion Avenue. I want to thank the select board for taking this difficult issue on. I'm in favor of the ordinance as it is. Uh, I wish it was stronger in some respects, but I can live with it as it is. It's kind of inconceivable that 11 years ago somebody died and nothing's changed. We're past the point of saying, I'm sorry that happened. We're past the point of saying, we'll talk to this person about changing what they're doing. We need an ordinance. We need to put this into law. And now's the time to do it. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Elizabeth Adams and I'm from 178 Browns River Road. Um, I live in the blue zone and have a fairly large parcel of property. Um, one of the unintended consequences of the shooting range portion of this ordinance, I'm wondering um, if individuals decide to move forward and um, create the range as needed according to whatever form ends up being um, created. Um, might they use that range more frequently than they might have otherwise? So for example, if um, my husband shoots just to sight in his rifle right before hunting season and we want to continue to do that safely on our property and we create the shooting range in accordance with the ordinance, might we then choose to shoot more frequently resulting in more noise, pollution in the area and bothering more of our neighbors. That is not our intention, but it is one of the unintended consequences that might happen as a result of requiring people to invest significant amounts of money into creating their own shooting ranges. Thank you. Kendall Chamberlain, Old Pump Road. I want the record to show I am opposed. I want no change to the ordinance. I'm participating to maintain my right to appeal. Uh, the statute that you requer, uh, refer to the sports shooting ranges, it actually specifies that any area created for the operation use of rifles, archery, pistols, shotguns, traps, keet, black powder, or any other shooting sport is included. That means that the target practicing that I do once a year, twice a year, to sight in my rifles is covered. I think it's a bad precedent. Only the people that are owners of the property which abut the range can bring any claim of nuisance against that range. Uh, there was an article written. I think you're going down a path where you're going to have some problems in the future. We've maintained the same level at my place as long as I've been there. We've been there since 1948. I think the town's going to run into some problems when you try to regulate them. You should note that firearms laws pit many citizens' sense of personal independence and safety against many other citizens' 
sense of collective peace and security. And it goes to the heart of the balance of power between a government and its citizenry. 30 seconds. A mandatory range notification form is a bad idea. With Article 7, you're going down the path of trying to single out a selected group of residents under the Vermont Constitution. No one person, family, or group is to be singled out for more benefits of government over another. You guys are painting a red scarlet letter on my back as a target shooter. Thanks. I'm Helen Donahue. I live at 3 Walnut Lane. I just want to thank you all for this. I support the proposed changes. I think public safety is very important. Thank you. Thank you. Randy Draper, 184 Towers Road Extension. I am uh, the unnamed neighbor uh, to Jim Weston. And um, Indeed, I stare at this large pile of unconsolidated material that he and his excavating crews have dumped across the road from us and into which he shot for a while. Um, my sense is that everything that Brian has shared with you before is absolutely on the mark and that uh, I, as a, on the tangent from that pile of dirt, uh, have still some concerns about driving my lawn tractor when there's firing going on in our neighborhood. We are in the blue zone. Um, we back up to uh, a large parcel of land that is contiguous with uh, Indian Brook and hunters come and go. Uh, we hear their gunshots and it doesn't really bother me, especially if they've checked with us if they're car crossing through our property. Um, we have a safety zone because our house happens to be in the corner of the property I'll just say that I don't think we should be in the blue zone uh, because Towers Road itself isn't in the blue zone. Um, but whatever, I've said this before, this is a public access, public safety issue, not a tax issue, <clears throat> not a constitutional issue. And I totally support what you've done so far and encourage you to do more. Thank you. Is there anyone else who has not had a chance to speak who would like to speak during this public hearing? Sir, are you, are you preparing to come forward? You want to shoot your gun, you have to have insurance. Speak up. Tell them you own the property for 40 years. <clears throat> I moved in here, bought my property, Forest Gerard, Indian Brook Road. I, I bought my property when I put my property, when I put the house up, I put up a shooting bank. And the only time I shoot down there is when the hunting season comes and I go out and shoot my rifle and target it in. Now, what's going to happen with this? You got to have insurance. Well, good. I mean, this isn't right. It's my property. And that's what I shoot on. I'm trying to tell you he's got dialysis three Sir, times. thank you. We, he's yeah. very clear. Thank you. I see some. Are you coming forward, sir, to speak? Good evening. My name is Evan Hughes. I'm a vice president of the Vermont Federation of Sportsmen's Clubs. Almost every range in the state belongs to a club that's open to the public, is a member of the federation. You're requiring the property owners where shooting takes place to certify that their property meets the guidelines of the NRA range source book. This is the NRA range source book. This is not set up for somebody plinking in their backyard. You're also saying it's unsafe to fire a 22 rifle for the purposes of target shooting. 
Yet at the same time, at that same location, you can fire 30 odd six for deer hunting. That's illogical. You could have looked at what Colchester did in their town over there, which abuts Essex, which worked for everybody. 30 seconds. And nobody's had a problem with it. You've got an insurance requirement on there based on North Carolina. And the North Carolina statute says it shall not apply to private ownership properties where shooting takes place, but only to substantial ranges. So be, f be frank with these people and tell them exactly what you're putting forward. Because I think very few of them have any idea that this is what you're expecting them to comply with. My name is Ashton McEwen. I live on 20 Upper Main Street, Essex. <clears throat> I am diametrically opposed to the proposed changes to require insurance. You know what you're doing. You know very well what you're doing. And I just want you to think about that come election day. We all know where Irene Renner is, not here. who has not spoken who would like to come speak during the hearing? Going once. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for taking the time to speak with us. This is a very emotional conversation. Thank you for being respectful to your neighbors. Thank you for being respectful to the board. We're going to close the public hearing and the conversation will turn to the board and we will be deliberating amongst ourselves. And if the board so desires, we will then vote. So I would like to receive a motion from a board member to close this public hearing. So moved. Is there a second? Uh, second. Any further discussion? All those in favor of closing the public hearing, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. So. Right. So according to the agenda, this, this is something that I wish we had adjusted at the beginning of the meeting. Yes, yes. I would rather not skip ahead to additional items of business that don't have something to do with this topic. And I'd like to continue the deliberation and move to 6E, final passage, so that we can continue the conversation. Would the board be favorable of amending the agenda out of order? Everybody okay with that? Can I have a motion to amend the agenda to move 6E to become 6C? So moved. I have a second. Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. Okay. So we have before us an amended ordinance based on our many, many, many months of discussion our hearing, the materials that we've reviewed, would any of the board members wish to discuss the amended ordinance further? Andy. Um, I have concerns about the, the registration of uh, shooting ranges uh, because the, the only thing that we're gonna do with it is check to see if the form's complete. Um, it will not, I don't see any way that it improves safety um, and I have concerns that if an if an accident were to occur at a shooting range where we had information about the location and configuration of the shooting range that in a civil lawsuit a jury would um, find us liable since we had information about the range and chose not to act on it um, so I'm uh, not in favor of uh, the ordinance. I, I'm, in, I'm in favor of the changes to the parks, but not the registration. Uh, if they were separate, I would certainly vote differently on each of them. Uh, that's my comments. Okay, Max. 
Uh, I heard tonight about uh, the need for better year-round signage. I'd like to, to uh, suggest that we, um, we do that so that uh, it's clear where it's allowed and where it's not. Um, I've also been giving thought about the insurance liability piece, and I've heard uh, you know a lot of a lot of good discussion about that. And I'm wondering if um, it could be if we on this notification form it talks about uh, frequent basis for target practice or rare occasions such as sighting a rifle uh, in deer season, and and that's two or three shots I, I've learned. Um, decided or something similar very low I'm wondering if the insurance requirement might make more sense to say it's for those that are identified as frequent basis use and perhaps not require it for those that um, are doing it uh, on rare occasion you know depending on which box they check and if if they check the uh, the infrequent box and it turns out it's it's frequent then that's a that's an issue that have to be dealt with but perhaps that's one way to uh, to deal with the insurance um, concerns that I've heard. <coughs> Andy, I'm confused. Which agenda item we're on? Yeah, right we. Oh, um, I'm sorry. Yes. Right. That's for the notification okay, but form. But we had that discussion tonight. We did. And I thought we were going to vet these. We are going to vet the form, but we need to vote on the ordinance okay. first. So my apologies. Hold that thought. Does anybody have anything to say in addition about the ordinance? Annie? Uh, I agree strongly that uh, permanent signage is an, uh, an important thing for, for reasons um, from both sides of the discussion, that uh, if you see a sign constantly, you will make yourself more aware. Okay. Pat, you had your hand up? I did, I'm not sure where this falls, but I'll say it now because why not? Um, as far as the notification form itself, not specifics to the notification form, but if we have that on file, I realize that there's a lot with open meeting law and the amount of information that's publicly accessible to people. Now, I don't know where the line is but there's clearly information that gets submitted to governmental agencies that is not accessible to the public. Um, you can't go into the DMV and ask to see XYZ's driver's license, even though it's a publicly available document. Would this fall into something that someone could request from the town, or would this fall into something where a person's or an individual's privacy outweighs the public good of a notification? To me, this doesn't seem like this is something that would be accessible if someone submitted a public information request because it contains so much personal information in the same way that I couldn't walk into the DMV and say, hey, I got in an accident with John down the street. Can I see his driver's license? They're not going to let me do that. Um, I look at this in a similar way that someone applies for a burn permit. They give their street address they say when they're going to do the burning and it's on file. We're not collecting a social security number. We're not collecting anything that is any different than what's already on a parcel map for an individual's property. So I would not say that this is something that is protected by privacy law, but I would defer to staff if you have any opinion on that or that perhaps we should find out. I think you're in the in the right place to think that this would be subject to open or to um, public records. Um, I, I see it as similar to a building permit, um, those types of things that do contain property information. Uh, that I think this would be a public document. Is that helpful? Yeah, certainly. I mean, I not to poo-poo Greg like <laughs> I, I agree with you completely I think you're probably right but I mean I would like to get legal information just you know because there is so much potential private information contained within the document I would just like to you know have an idea I mean it is I thought I saw yeah, I'm here. oh okay sorry I was looking for you and I was like right construed by the Vermont Supreme Court over the years and 
it's likely to be public record. Okay. But I, I'm not going to give you a definitive yeah, answer. Yeah, no, it's, right it, it's fine. I just want an idea. And it explicitly states in the uh, ordinance that the information will be public for neighbors and future residents. So it explicitly states in here that it's public information. It does. Yeah. Awesome. Great. Yeah, thanks. That's an awesome catch. Any other comments or questions? So the question before us is, should the board approve the ordinance as amended? And um, if you do not have any further questions or comments or discussion, then if you are ready to vote, we should do so. Annie, do you have any more questions or comments? Um, Eric's, Eric Bailey's uh, the first person uh, speaking about the dates. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm struggling to, in this moment, understand. I understand what he said. I'm trying to find that. The dates? Mm. The date, can I say? Absolutely. The dates are November 1st through December 15th in, in the ordinance. November, uh -huh. yeah, it's and line 62. Thank you. Mr. Bailey informed us that um, he believes there's changes forthcoming in 2020 regarding the dates. I don't know the official, whether those are official yet, whether they've been posted, whether the state has ruled on that. That is something that can be changed if we decide to vote tonight and then the dates come out and we wanted to discuss whether to expand the timing. We can discuss it at that point. I'm hesitant to make the, the change now, not knowing for sure whether that's going to happen. So. Um, um, the, the discussion is now further. I appreciate that. We, our staff will take care of doing the research needed to answer the question. Thank you, Mr. Bailey. Um, okay, so thank you. Were there, were there any other questions? Or I would comments? just like to clarify that my question was simply that I needed to find the date on the thing I understood. Oh, okay. Mr. Bailey and I understand you. No, no, no. I just want to make sure that we're all clear that I... <coughs> okay. Sorry, I do have another question. Of course. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling a little bit with the language that's in here, <coughs> understanding what the what triggers an offense uh, that, that would lead to the, the fines that are listed here. Is it the existence of a shooting range that's not registered, or is it the use <coughs> of a shooting range that's not registered? So um, but that's, I, 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 maybe I'm, the language is here somewhere, but I, I'm not sure how we intend to enforce this because uh, it has a start date of the January 1st and um, if somebody doesn't register until later and it's discovered they have a shooting range are they subject to fines back you know backdated to the beginning of the ordinance or is it only on days that they actually pull a trigger in, in a cause of violation I just it's not clear to me you had asked that question earlier, and I think Greg provided an answer. But Greg, would you be willing to repeat your answer that you sent privately? Um, sure. The police would uh, make an interpretation about that if, um, they honestly, did some more consideration um, of how you want to handle it. The police could could handle it of it's it's a use thing, um, or they could handle it of when you pull the trigger, or they could handle it of how long it's been there, and if it's not in not registered on a day but day to day basis. So so the ordinance says fifty dollars a day for the first offense. Right. So if, if if someone is discovered somebody has a target on a tree in their property um, or on a on a on a, a, a dirt pile, but they haven't shot on it for six months, <clears throat> are they subject to six months worth of fifty dollars a day when they when it's discovered or how how is this I was just trying to, I'm really, I'm trying to understand what we're, what we're intending to enforce. Yeah, it, it would take some more discussion with the police. Chief, would, may we ask your, um, to weigh in on this particular question? Right, you could do it either way. You could do it at the discharge of, of the incident, or you could do it when the range wasn't. Uh, I think I commented 
back. I don't know if you guys got that. Greg, was that forwarded? I did. It was at the end of the yes. day. Um, Bring the microphone up to the right. Yep. So the problem, the problem we have is if you do it by the time that a, that a shot is fired and you get a discrepancy about whether or not that shot actually occurred, um, then whether or not can you enforce. It's actually easier to enforce to say there is a range there and it's happening, um, to say it's, you haven't registered it so you were in violation. Otherwise, you're having to do it on a shot-by-shot -shot basis of did it occur, didn't occur. You can do it either way, and we will force it whatever way that you tell us to do it. But as I said to Greg, we would like clarity. So whatever you tell us you want to happen, we can enforce it equally and fairly to everybody. Um, so we would like a definition, and we're happy to help you with that, but we would like to know is it when it is fired or is it when the rate, when we get a complaint that there's a range there, we go there, there's a range there, and we find out it's not registered, does it start at that point? Does that answer your question? It does. And in my opinion, that latter explanation feels like the more reasonable approach. So it would be day of discovery of a... The day that we learn, I would say it would be the day that we learn that there's a range there and it is not registered per the ordinance. Because that's what the ordinance is. It's a registration ordinance. It's not a discharge. Right? It's, it's saying that you have to register your range. And, and at that point, we learn that it's not done. We're not having to prove whether a shot or not occurred. If we can say, yes, there's a range there and it's not registered, it's you know, that's a lot easier than a neighbor saying, I did fire that shot, and, another, and the person saying, no, I didn't fire that shot. Prove it. You're not going to take their guns away and do forensics. Correct. Is that helpful? Did well, it, 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 it clarifies to me that this is, I don't think this is enforceable. I don't know how, I don't know how we, you know, how we, how we prove that somebody has a range on their property. Ladies and gentlemen, the conversation is at the board level. Please keep your comments to yourselves. Thank you. I'm struggling with it still. You had other questions earlier. Uh, over the weekend, you sent some questions in. Do you want to discuss those here? Um, let me look at my list. There's other ones I want to bring up. I think I think most of them have been addressed. Um, you talked about the question of right. You can have somebody denies that they that they fired their gun, but if it's if 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 the intent is to base it on discovery of a unregistered shooting range, and then the fine of fifty dollars a day starts until they have insurance. Um, I guess that's that sounds like that's the intent, but we haven't really said that. Um, I don't think the intent was to make them the. The intent was to register the range in the ordinance. Oh, I did have another question. Uh, there's nothing in the ordinance that prevents someone from target shooting on public land. Okay. Is that our intent to allow or to? There's no. There's no restriction there. In the in the ordinance. There there. We do have a restriction that the only time firearms discharge is appropriate on public land is during the t window of no, November it's, 1st. It's in those specific parks. There's the, the, the Ringonsworth parcel. There's the Horton property. There are other ah, town-owned properties that are considered public properties that are not covered by this ordinance where anybody can go um, t and target, target practice without having to have insurance, without registering a uh, shooting range. I see where you're going. I see what, you, what you're saying. I think what we're trying to address is shooting ranges on private property, and we were addressing hunting on public property. But parcels like the Unsworth parcel, for example, we had an audience member asking if we were going to regulate on that property, and we said no at the time. And I think we still stand by that. We're being very particular about those public parcels where we want to limit the dates. So I think this might, you know, Greg or Evan. Excuse me, Greg. 
ask a clarification. Absolutely. Because it's is, is, is your question can someone hunt on say the writ the unsworth property? Or could they establish something like a firing could, range? Could I take my on twenty two onto the Unsworth property, put a put a target on a tree, ensure that there's nobody behind in the background and shoot at that target all day long? And I'm not committing any offense anywhere because I'm, I'm, I'm shooting a gun on, on public property. The ordinance does not cover target shooting on public property. I thank you for your question. I don't have an answer for you. I, I would say legally no. Um, the way the outdoor shooting range condition is defined, I think so we could go to those properties and, and hunt. Um, the outdoor shooting range talks about shooting range, firing range, or other property where people may discharge a firearm for purposes other than hunting. It goes on to say that it may be allowed or where discharge of firearms is permitted, provided that any property owner who has an outdoor range on their property shall submit to the clerk's office a completed notification form. Unless the town is putting together a shooting range um, notification form on public land, I, I think that any target shooting on public property would not be allowed. I think we need to clarify that then because the, the language here says that if you, it says that the definition of a shooting range is, not, is something that you've done on your own property. If you do it on public property, it's not defined as a shooting range according to the language that's in here. Bill, are you, are you catching that? I, I hear you. Uh, I'll look at it. I'm not. I know. Bill, we're, we're talking about posting, say, Saxon Hill or Indianville, and these are the times you can shoot. These are the times you can hunt on this property. Are, would we then be required, would we be covered if we put up the same sign that says this is the only time you can discharge on these properties? What's the difference? If you come to the property at any other time and you are doing target shooting or whatever, you're not actually hunting, you're just firing a weapon. That's the only difference I have. We, we and the public is not expecting you there. We, we could talk about that. I don't, I don't think this is the, the poor forum to start yeah. bringing up these, okay. these issues and to ask me to start Sorry. opining. Yeah. Any other? Um, I, th I think that uh, that addresses uh, all, all of my questions until we get to the forum. Okay. Okay. I'd like to get a sense of the board at this point in time whether you feel you have enough information to vote on passing this ordinance as amended. Pat? I would like more time, actually. I have some. I think I have heard some things that I would like to get some real specific clarification about. I know that we've kind of leaned one way or another. Um, but, you know, the will of the board, if we're going to vote, then I will absolutely vote. But I, I think there are enough open-ended questions that we may want to go back and, you know, take a look at, you know, I don't want to say unintended consequences, but, you know, it did bring up some points that I think are salient um, right now. So... Uh, okay. My preference would be to get those addressed and then take a look at it in September. Thank you. Andy? I think we need to have the discussion about how we intend to enforce and uh, also answer the question about whether um, shooting ranges are allowed on uh, public property, unregistered shooting ranges. Annie? Um, okay. A question first, please, Elaine. How long did we say this discussion has been at this table? Oh, you mean today? <laughs> no, um, not today. We have had this board, this board in various memberships. Right. It's been 10 years. Uh -huh. So a, a 10 year discussion is a long time. And while I'm sitting here, what would be really easy to do is to find a way to put it off longer 
that would be easy. That would be less frightening and um, a little simpler. I could breathe easier, a little bit longer, right? But I could do that for three years. I could do that till the next person like takes the seat. And so that doesn't feel comfortable to me. It feels to me like I, I need to be more courageous than that. However, I do think September feels slightly better to me, not as a place to put it, to put it off for more years, but as a place to put it, to clarify, tweak, and define more clearly these, um, these details that would make us all more comfortable okay. to be confident. And I, I do understand that that puts all of us in a revisiting position, and I do apologize about that because this is a very passionate discussion. People are bringing themselves in their time here, and I don't mean to make it that we're all waffling and wondering. I mean to make it that we're all clearer, more defined, and more resolute, and more confident so that we can best serve our public. Okay, well said. Max? Um, I admit this is not perfect. Uh, come September, it won't be perfect then, and it won't be perfect in a year from then. I've been on this board for a long time. I've been in many of these discussions for those 10 years. Uh, and uh, I think somebody, I think it was Bruce Post said it's, it's a baby step. I think it's a step in the right direction. I know that I'm um, hearing uh, we've gone too far, we didn't go far enough, we're doing it just right. Uh, I admit it's not perfect, and I don't think we're ever going to make it perfect. So waiting to me is just a delay tactic that is uh, unwarranted, and I'm ready to go tonight. Mm. So I'm in between the two of you. Mm. I am very conscious of not throwing out the baby with the bathwater and letting the per perfect be the enemy of the good. We need to do something. We need to stop waiting. We need to stop postponing. However, out of respect to specific questions that certain board members have, I feel we do need to answer them. And so what I would like to ask is that we table this conversation, this vote, until September, at which time we will vote. We will get as much information as we possibly can. And at that time, this board needs to do what it needs to do. Andy? Just a, just a clarifying question. We have a, we, there is a select board meeting between now and the, whatever the, the, the second meeting in September yes. where we have a discussion about the details of the ordinance at that one so that we can actually approve it. Because if we change it at the next meeting in September, the second meeting in September, then we, have to do we still have to have another public hearing. That's correct. So I'm assuming at the next select board meeting we'll see a revision based on two thoughts. You can, you can warn a, another public hearing based on changes that you make tonight. If you're comfortable to make changes to clarify um, target shooting is or is not allowed on public land, we can present, we can make that change and present it. And I think you can warn the public hearing and adopt it at the next meeting if you want to. Um, if you want clarification of what's gonna be a violation and, and how we decide that, as the chief said, what's your direction? We can clarify that and put it into the language and, and go forward. I think if you want to have more information and more discussion at a future meeting, then it will take two steps. I guess it's a question of how comfortable you are tonight. I, have, I was going to ask questions about what do you want us to work on. Those are the two things that I have. Um, four changes. The next meeting in September, September 9th, it's a joint meeting with the trustees. It's already packed full. Um, I would not recommend having this discussion on the 9th. So it's, and, and that's, if that's the case, if you want to have more in-depth discussion, then it would be the 23rd of September for more of a workshop and then more in a public hearing for October at some point. At this point, I would like to, I don't think we're ready to verbally instruct the staff to make specific changes to the ordinance. So that says to me, we have to give them the questions we have get the answers back and receive a revised ordinance based on that. Are you willing or okay with having that happen and then that material being part of our packet for the September 9th meeting as part of the reading file at the very least? And if we have time, we could pull it out and discuss it. At this point, we are down to two issues. 
about the ordinance that I can, so how we enforce an unregulated shooting ranges on public property. So if we have this, the answers that we're looking for, I'm, I'm not, I don't want this to go into October. This is, it's getting to be a bit much. So we need to, we need to do our job. And there's always going to be more information that we would like to have to make a more fully informed decision. And we do know that ordinances have an amendment process. So if we do approve at some point in the very near future and we see down the road once it's implemented that there's something that needs to be fixed, we know how to fix it. I, I really don't want to keep going after all of the work that we've done so far. So would that be a sufficient compromise in terms of getting the answers and having that stuff be in our packet for the ninth? As long as it satisfies the requirements of the process. It can be in the reading file. I, if you have a packed crowd tonight, I don't know right. if you're going to be able to. Well, so if it's in the reading file and we approve the final, it can't be in the reading file. It has to be on the agenda. It has to be on the agenda. So, special meeting. Um, the other option is a special meeting. And I knowing how difficult it is to schedule that, I'm still willing to do it. I am too. We could call a special meeting solely on that topic, so that we're not putting other agenda items on it, and everybody knows exactly what we're going to talk about, and that's all we're going to talk about. Would that be acceptable? I, I like that a lot. I feel, I feel I feel good about the specifically honing, cleaning, clearing, uh, d deciding, and then agreeing that we have a document and wording that feels really correct so that when we sit down again on purpose to vote, I mean, not that we didn't tonight, I'm sorry, I'm just using too many words, that, that we have already dug through and been really clear. Okay. So today is August 19th. Somewhere between now and when is, if we, if we go to September 23rd as a hearing, if we have to back up a week as the warning date, is that correct? I'm trying to think, okay. the, the, the ordinance, the, the charter to change an ordinance, if you make changes based on the warning, you need to warn it three days ahead of time. I think you can do it the 16th and you have a special meeting on the 16th of September, which is a Monday. I think you can have it the following 23rd, but I, uh, the following Monday, the 23rd. But I want to double check that. So then we should have our special meeting on the topic between now and the 16th of September. Okay. Can I ask board members after the meeting to go home and check their calendars and provide Greg with all of the evenings that they're available between tomorrow and September 16th, <coughs> September 15th, and. We will hold a special meeting for the purpose of approving a final ver amended version of the ordinance and then approving another warning just, just for clear, a hearing. We're going to vote on it. You're saying that we're going to approve it. What we're going to do is we're going to vote on it. I think we'll discuss it and then if we're happy with it, we'll vote on it. And I think so we'll, that special meeting will be a vote in order to, and, and then uh, if it's warranted, a subsequent vote on a warning for another public hearing to happen on the 23rd. Annie? Just to be clear for public, people who maybe don't know how, all that, that a special meeting is also something that public can come sit and Absolutely. be Absolutely, 100% open to the public just like this. We'll probably do it here. So just just want to make sure that we're clear on the, on the questions that need to be answered. You, you, you mentioned the, the uh, target shooting on public land does that constitute a shooting range uh, you know, there's how, what's the intent for enforcement it will be enforced based on discovery of an undocumented or a use of an un undocumented uh, shooting range and then the, the third thing that I brought up earlier and I'll bring up again during the discussion of the forum is the liability associated with having knowledge of the location and configuration statement about its safety and whether there's whether a Vermont jury would find the town town liable in the case where it, if an accident were to occur and criminal activity were to be uh, somebody were to be convicted of a crime and then a civil lawsuit came afterward for compensation 
that the town would not be liable. And I, and I think it, it would, you know, I didn't ask this question earlier, but I don't know. I mean, I know Vermont League of Cities and Towns is our insurer. I, I'd like, you know, I, I just want to make sure that, that they're okay with the fact that we have this information in our possession and are choosing not to act on it with the risk that it could lead to liability. I'm just sorry, just trying to look out for everybody's the Absolutely. Towns. I want to give a scenario to see if you feel the same way about this scenario. We require all of our residents to license their dogs. And when a dog incident occurs, um, you know, we know that the dog lives at that property and we know that they could be a, a dog, like it, maybe it's a pit bull or a Doberman or something, and we know that it's a potentially dangerous breed, something happens, is the town liable for that dog's behavior even though we knew it lived there? The dog licensing is a state function, I believe, isn't it? Okay, so you're saying the town has zero liability because so, it's a state statute. So, yeah, so, and so like uh, another example is my neighbor has a tree that fell on my house. Um, they didn't have to register that tree and it fell off and came out of, out of their property onto my property. It's causing right. Okay, do you guys have those three things? I'll follow up with you after. Okay. So, all right, so we are going to um, table the vote on this ordinance. Motion to table. And would anybody like to make a motion to do so? I move that the select board table the uh, vote on the uh, shooting ordinance until uh, a later date. Do you want to specify the date? Um, well, right, right to be determined. May I have a second? I'll second. All those in favor, please, uh, any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. All right, we will be tabling the discussion. As I asked, please submit to Greg your availability for a special meeting between tomorrow and September 15th. Okay. okay. Yes, Annie. So everyone, thank you very much for being here this evening. And we uh, we have another business item. Yes, we have another business item to discuss the notification form for outdoor shooting range. I think because it's all related, we should move right on to that. So, item D. So item sixty. I think that they're not aware. So with your indulgence, we'll go to item 6D, the notification form. Everybody who's leaving, we're about to talk about the notification form, if you're still interested in hearing about that. I think they just didn't understand. If you could keep it down a little, we still have a long way to go. Thank you. Uh, Let's keep we're being asked if we want to take a break. Excuse me. We're no, we're going to keep moving. Okay, so the form that is mentioned in the ordinance is not something that is part of the ordinance. So the reason for that is because if over time there are necessary changes to the uh, form, we don't have to go through a whole hearing process of revising the ordinance because the form will not be part of the ordinance. Common practice in legislation. So we have a modified form here that staff has edited for us at the top of the form, Andy, your request of a notification that the property would be added to the E911 database has been accommodated. And the, uh, we need to approve the form unless the board has any other questions or edits. Um, we have discussed this form at great length. So I know, Max, you had a comment earlier in the meeting. Yes. If, now would be the time to bring it up. Okay. So, and again, I apologize for bringing that up uh, at the inappropriate time, but uh, based on what I heard from the public tonight, uh, something resonated with me about the liability insurance, that if it's for um, target practice that uh, is rare uh, occasion, such as sighting a rifle before deer season, where very few shots are fired in order to get the rifle sighted, uh, 
I'd like us to perhaps think about not needing liability insurance for that. We don't uh, require it for uh, hunting where you shoot maybe the same number. Uh, however, if it's going to be one that's done on a frequent basis, then I think it would be more appropriate to have it on that one. Um, so I'd like us to at least consider that. So, and thank you, Max. And Pat, you had questions at the previous meeting when we discussed this topic about coverage and cost, and the staff did in uh, research based on your request. Did you have any um, feedback or qu further questions regarding the information the staff collected? Yeah, I mean, I don't have any further questions. This is actually exactly the information that I was looking for. Um, and, you know, just to be clear, like my concern about this was always the financial impact. I did not want to create a barrier based on how much money you make okay. as to whether or not you can afford to have a shooting range that the town determines. And most of what's in there is, you know, simple safety requirements. So if you're going to be using a shooting range actively, like, you know, those make sense. I just didn't want to attach, you know, specific dollar signs that may have been insurmountable to some people and not to others. Um, the information that the town found were in a few cases, I think larger amounts, but in multiple instances, either no additional increase a year or an increase of year that amounted to less than $10 a month. So in my opinion, those are more than reasonable. Um, and in this case, that was, that was my primary concern about it, not creating a barrier. And it doesn't seem like there is one from the information that we were presented. There seems to be a variety of options that are yes. affordable to not. Yes, and if it doesn't work with the insurance you have, there are lists of multiple insurance agencies who will provide it. Right. Okay. okay. Anybody else have questions or comments regarding liability insurance? Andy. Um, I think the discussion about how we're going to enforce this comes into play uh, given that uh, if it's a complaint based, you know, uh, I mean, we're not going to have officers driving around on roads listening for gunshots trying to find undocumented shooting ranges. Um, and so if a, if a property owner has shoots on their property and they're comfortable that none of their neighbors are going to complain they they may be able to get away with not having insurance um, or they may find that okay I'm gonna shoot once a, once a year and I'll just send in my fifty dollars uh, for the fine um, I'm just I just I, I need to understand how we're going to enforce it to figure out what, you know where's the how much is the fine going to be versus how much you're going to pay for insurance. You know, you a little you bit might, like not having Obamacare. You might choose to take the risk and, <laughs> and not, not get the insurance and, and hope your neighbors don't turn you in. Um, so so I, I'm, I'm, I, I, that's why I, I think I need to have the, the question of how we're going to enforce it before I... I, I'm, I mean, that, that's... And, a, and, and to be blunt, I guess I'm, I'm against putting a, a requirement of liability insurance on a recreational activity that and when we don't do that for any any other uh, any other recreational activities people do on their private property and the example i said before like a, my neighbor's tree could fall on my house and damage my house or damage me um and we don't require people to register their tall trees that are in, within range of their neighbor's house um, which is another you know probably happens more often than stray bullets but um i'm 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 not in favor of the the insurance I would say that the interior argument that a person has as to whether or not to go with the fine versus go with the insurance is up to them. It's not mm -hmm. something that we have any control over, nor should we try to account for it. Um, and in terms of the risk of a, you know, for your example, a tree falling on your property, everyone who has a mortgage has to have homeowner's insurance. And I know that a town does not impose homeowner's right. insurance on there's people. No, there's no requirement that the amount of liability is personal decision. Yes, that's correct. But the insurance does need to be there. And considering the fact that we are trying to ensure safety of surrounding properties, as well as the people who live on the properties, I don't think it's unreasonable to have liability insurance. You have to have it if you have a car. You have to have it if you have a house. I understand that a municipality is not imposing that rule, but 
we are trying to perhaps break some new ground here and do something that guarantees or at least helps to ensure that a person who endures an injury as a result of a shooting range accident is able to be made whole in some way. I don't think it's unreasonable. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. We are not entertaining public comment at the moment. Thank you for your feedback. So, and the other comment I have about Max's um, recommendation, I, I think we either have it or we don't. I don't think we should be saying, well, you're only shooting twice a year, you're shooting more than twice a year. I, it's too much for us to determine. It's too much to enforce. It's too much to ask the police to keep track of. I think we either have it or we don't. So, um, we should probably wrap up this conversation about liability before we move on to any other aspects of the form. Does anybody else have any feedback or thoughts? You want to keep it in? I'd like to keep it in. I was hoping we could uh, stage it where the rare ones don't need it, but uh, that just seems I like an added if level. If it's too of difficult for the police to uh, to enforce that kind of thing, then Pat, where are you? Yeah, I mean, otherwise I'm fine with the form. I don't see anything here that's terribly onerous. I mean, I see with what Andy is saying, but I mean, I think that argument is the case with anyone who's doing anything illegal, you know? I mean, of course, you need to, if a neighbor's house is broken into, the neighbor is probably going to need to call the police to let them know that something bad has happened. Um, you know, the police don't necessarily drive around into people's backyard to see whether or not a window has been smashed out or not. Not to, you know, say they're necessarily the same, but the parallel is there. So So you're I mean, saying that the liability should be required or not? Required? Yeah, the liability sure. should be required. It is not financially onerous okay. um, as far as I'm concerned. It <coughs> seems fine to me. Okay. Annie, what are your thoughts? I'm just trying to get the sense of the board on yeah, this particular Yeah, I it's something that I need to mull over longer, which isn't very healthy for what you're trying to ask of us now about moving past this piece. Um, <coughs> I feel that my mulling would be um, not that I don't I don't know that I would be um, I, I don't know that I'm on either side enough that I'm going to be troublesome. I don't I don't know. Okay. I know I'm not. I'm being very waffly about this piece. I'm sorry about the, uh, only about the, the, the liability insurance. The liability insurance. And I guess what I'm trying to decide. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. What I'm trying to decide is, as a baby step, where are we going and and what and why, and so. I feel a little bit as though the liability insurance is. I hear you. You're saying that it's a, a backup scenario for what a use of such a thing on a property could bring about. I'm going to stop my statements and leave it at that for the moment. Okay. Mm -hmm. Andy, can I just get a sense of where you are? I think I know, but I want to be sure. I, I feel, are you interested in keeping the liability requirement, or? No, I think it's. I think liability is a personal decision that the, the property owner should make. I mean, there there are some properties that don't have homes on them, mm -hmm. so they may or may not have any liability, you know, insurance on that property to begin with. This would be a new policy for them, and I think for those folks, it would be much more. Than a right, than an additional writer. I mean, I checked my policy today. I have three hundred thousand. It, it probably wouldn't be that much to add, add on another two hundred thousand if I chose to. Um, but someone who has no no structure on their property has no may may not have any insurance on that property. It's it's a bigger bigger pill for them as well. Yeah, I'd rather again stage it, but uh, if it's in or out, I'd like to see it in. Okay. Any other comments regarding the rest of the form? Are we happy with the rest of the form? Andy? Uh, I'm not. I want to do away with it. but. Uh. Got it. Okay. So if there are no other 
comments or questions about the content of the form, am I, does stat, do Evan or Greg, do you have any information or stuff that you need to share in addition or can we continue? You're all good? Okay. All right, so we need to vote on the notification form. Mm. Early on, was told yeah. that, they, that there would be discussion about this particular yeah. piece okay. of the meeting, okay. and you have not allowed people to publicly speak. Thank you for reminding me of that. This has been a long day and a contentious conversation. Are we ready to open this part to the public? Okay. We're going to repeat the process. One minute, 30 seconds. You get to speak once. Please come to the mic, state your name and street, and thank you again. Ben Bro, my family owns land on Lost Nation Road. Uh, first, I want to address the insurance. If you look at the August 1st uh, email from the town manager, it says if they ask what it's for, just say personal liability. If you tell them gun range on property, they may not give you info. So all this is just liability insurance. No one has actually gotten a quote to say if you have a range on your property. I fall under the family that owns just land with no dwelling on it. This is going to be a substantial cost if I can even get it covered. So you're putting me out of, I'm either going to break your ordinance or I'm going to have to pay through the roof for something like that. I also think that you're missing the point. This whole form is in my, I'm sorry to say it's garbage. Everything on here is copied from either North Carolina or Texas. If you look at North Carolina, Pitt County, North Carolina, where liability insurance and the exact copy of the site plan is, it tells you that this is intended for shooting range facilities, which if you look at a shooting range facility, does not include target practice area on private land. Texas, you exact copy of construction standards. Again, this, this uh, is on property that you pay a fee for. It's, it's all commercial ranges. You're making, us, you're making us on these private ranges do what a commercial range would have to be. It's, that's what it wasn't intended for. And I think that's the point that's being missed here. You're, you, it, there's a reason you had to go to other states to find examples. You, you can't find anything in Vermont. Thank you, Mr. Bro. It, Hi, I'm Lee Beauregard. I did call uh, my insurance agent and asked her, told her I don't have a range, and asked her to look. For an umbrella policy, once I said shooting range, the cost went up three to five times. Once I looked at, um, um, for my homeowner's insurance, it got dropped by three of the four um, policies. So it's not easy, unless you're a member of the NRA and go through their insurance somehow, it's not easy. Um, so far as a shooting range on my property, if I buy land out in the center, or the town, sorry, um, and I buy acreage, there may be somebody who uses my land, as some of these people have said. I don't know if they've put up a range. They may have just put up a target on a tree. Am I going to get nailed if somebody's using that from the date that somebody heard a shot and I don't know about that? 30 seconds. And as Mr. Bro said, you're using commercial property things. The last <laughs> thing, please think about having these FOIA requests and things like that. My mom died. It was an unintended, unattended death. A police officer went through the house to make sure there wasn't anything. He told me, I see a firearm. It looks like maybe your dad's old hunting rifle. Do not put anything in the obituary that said anybody in the family is a hunter because somebody could come into your house while you're at the funeral, break in and take that weapon and use it to commit a crime. Please, you're doing the same thing with, with registering um, Thank you. ranges. Thanks. So she's right about that because there was a guy that we used to play softball on his field, Sean, Sean McEwen. Thank you, John. And uh, that happened. At his funeral, somebody broke in, stole all the guy's rifles from probably somebody they knew. 
any rate, what I wanted to say quickly is, I really think you gotta think about enforcement, even if you go with this, because say I'm like, oh, I don't know if I wanna spend the money to, to do the liability, even though I've had a range there, I don't know if I wanna spend the money. So I haven't shot, and I, I've been thinking about it, and then they're doing construction across the street, and the neighbors hear the tailgate bang against the truck, and they go, they're shooting. And SXPD come, and they go, hey, the neighbors say you're shooting. I'm going, no, I haven't shot. Well, they say you were shooting. Who's the burden of proof on, and what is the burden of proof? And are they gonna try to start fining me 50 bucks a day for a tailgate banging? Because it's obvious that we did have a range there at one point, and we still got the burn. But so that's something you gotta think about too. They talked about it easier to prove it, but isn't what you always see is what it is. Thank you. Ed Wilbur, Brown River Road. Um, again, I would like to point out uh, the very bottom of your form uh, would force every one of us uh, to perjure ourselves uh, by stating that we uh, certify that our range follows NRA uh, guidelines. I'd again like to point out uh, section 2.0.1, uh, sourcebook is in no way to be used as a substitute for or in lieu of consultation with architects, engineers, and attorneys who shall be called upon to make specific recommendations for individual range design, construction, <clears throat> and use of shooting ranges. Section 2.01.4, neither the reader of this sourcebook or anyone else is to rely on any representation, drawing, or statement made in this sourcebook rely on the source book to design, build, construct, or operate a range, rely on any claim that a particular range is in compliance with, or designed, built, constructed, or operated according to or pursuant to this source book when visiting, attending, or taking part in activities such as a range. 30 seconds. So again, I would like to point out that the thing you're forcing us to do is that range handbook, which is over 600 pages long, by the way, and I've read through almost all of it at this point, very little of it applies to home ranges on private property. As a matter of fact, none of it does. So by asking us to sign that and certify, uh, it's, it's an impossible thing to do, and I'm not willing to sign a form like that, and I will go to court for it. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mike Pelletier. I gave you my letter. Yes. Yeah. When you read it, I hope you do, it says, hopefully the town is not inadvertently applying a commercial standard requirement for NRA range compliance to a mom and pop occasional limited use range. I believe that there exists some safe locations to practice shooting in Essex without huge expenditures for an NRA compliant range. You didn't say when you were looking at the amendment for the items that you're gonna discuss, and I think Andy asked to have that summarized, you're not even gonna talk about whether there's an exemption for a commercial range or not. You're just a, you're blatantly ignoring that. Are you gonna talk about that? Are you gonna review that? Or is your mind already closed? Could I have an answer? All of the materials that we've been talking about are what we're talking about. We wanna be talking about all ranges because the safety of the community it doesn't depend on what kind of range it is. So you, you will only accept NRA range guides for all installations, is that what your, your position is? At the is? moment, that's what the, the form says. Hi, John Bourbon, 348 Browns River Road. In reading this document right here, the one thing that stands out in my mind, this is like your plan B, your backdoor approach to stop all shooting in Essex. There's just no way in hell that this is doable for the private landowner. We can't do this. Um, I've been shooting 31 years in my house with no problems. I'm respectful of my neighbors. I don't shoot when they're home. This is just a way to try and put people out of business for shooting. Thank you. Elizabeth Adams, 178 Browns River Road. Um, so my question is related to the comment about ensuring the safety of surrounding properties related to the shooting ranges. My concern would be that if this is required, um, it, individuals would choose not to register a shooting range. Um, because they don't do it very frequently and therefore would not have safe precautions to shoot safely. For example, dirt, a 
pile to block the bullet from traveling because as someone mentioned, if there's an appearance of a range, that's when um, there's the potential for um, violating the ordinance if it's passed. So if I didn't want to register my property to shoot infrequently, I might shoot in an unsafe manner because I don't want there to be an appearance of a range. Does that make sense? Yes, so that's my concern. And I think most of us who have um, spots on their property where they shoot, I think we all shoot in a safe manner. Um, I think we know how to do that. Uh, my other just comment here is, why do we need to identify frequent basis versus rare occasions? Um, rifle, sighting in a, 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 a rifle before deer season, um, if I'm a terrible shot, I'm not, but if I was, it might be frequent, even though on the form it says it's infrequent, because I'm shooting a lot more, because I'm not a very good shot to get my rifle sighted in. Thank you. Brian Murphy, Brian Murphy, 187 Towers Road. Um, regarding the standards, uh, I have no objection to someone that says that we can't meet a particular standard. But the, the question I have for those is, what is the replacement standard? Because it seems to be that there is the NRA standard or no standard. If there's an alternative standard, it, I would, I'd like people to propose with that. Um, because all we're hearing is that we can't have a standard. But I think any common sense knows their, their safety. And I think a group of people could get together and indicate you know downrange, there's no house or something like that. So uh, instead of just entirely eviscerating the NRA standard, propose a standard. Um, separately, I wrote, it's in the board packet, uh, I'd like the notification form to ask the landowner to certify that children under the age of 18 are supervised, um, and also that the landowner uh, or the tenant is on the premises, because you've got to have someone to talk to if things aren't going well. And I don't want to call the police, I want to call the landowner um, to rectify and be a good neighbor. but. If people are off for the weekend and then their friends who they can't supervise or there are kids there, that's a problem. Thank you. John Mer uh, 58 Brigham Hill Road. I got a question on who determines what a frequent shooter may be. You may choose to go to the market six times a day to get popcorn. I may choose to go 12 times a day to get popcorn because I got 12 kids coming home at different times of the day. I think setting a guideline vaguely of whom is now a frequent shooter and whom is not. I think getting the police force to run to everybody's pieces of woods all over Essex is absolutely ludicrous when Jimmy Joe's got a motorcycle that backfires every five minutes. Are you kind of infringing on this guy by banging on his door saying, did you shoot, did you shoot? Maybe I just want to watch TV on a Sunday night with my kid, not have the cops banging on my door asking me if I'm shooting. Furthermore, my neighbor doesn't like me. He shoots all the time. I just heard him shoot. You're going to spend so much money in police force running around constantly to try to regulate who's shooting, who's not. How about the M80s a kid shoot? It's ludicrous. This is complete ludicrousy. Hi, guys. Uh, Jeff Kirshner, 247 Brigham Hill uh, Road. Um, first off, I got some privacy concerns uh, with providing detailed maps of private property containing the information that you're asking for there. Um, they've spoke about people knowing that you have guns there and all, and uh, you all know me. You all know that I do have privacy concerns, um, which is why individually you guys came to the house as opposed to open to the public. Um, number two, if a range was in existence before 2006, I want to know if you've got to fill out this form. I'm not sure that you do by state statute. Um, liability insurance, I'm totally against requiring this. If you mandate insurance for activities on private property that's applicable only to the group of people who submit this notification form, that sounds a lot like discrimination and is financially burdensome for some people. I don't think that's right. Uh, and finally, uh, talking about the NRA range book. On one of the very first pages, it's section 1.02.4. This source book may not be utilized to establish design standards or criteria for ranges, period. It doesn't apply to what you guys are trying to do. Um, it is a big book. 
it's made for commercial ranges and it says it. If you guys read the first two pages of it, you'll see that it does not apply to what you're trying to apply it to. Thank you. Brad Kennison, Bixby Hill Road. Uh, I've also done my research on liability insurance. And in canvassing those co insurance companies and explaining, or asking the question, if I have a range on my property and there's an incident, would you pay the liability claim? Yes, we would. And then we would cancel your policy. They would not renew the policy. So where are you gonna go and get insurance? Second question, Greg, could you bring up on the um, ordinance about the shooting range restrictions, if you would, please? You warned a public hearing on a firearms ordinance of which the note of uh, the Notification form and its restrictions are a part thereof and should be part of the discussion and a vote on the ordinance, which includes the notification form. It should not be separate. So when you have the meeting the next time, it all should be together, lumped together, not separate uh, discussions. Thank you. Kendall Chamberlain, Old Pump Road. You're starting to get a taste of that scarlet leather that's right on my back right now. There's one thing that I see with this board that is very surprising. There's a lot of people, a lot of my neighbors and everything in this room that obviously know a lot more about this rule that you're looking to impose on us than I do and than you do. Why aren't you using our neighbors as your resource? Why aren't you practicing Vermont's freedom and unity and working with your neighbors and with your whole society that you have? Get somebody from that side, get somebody from this side, get them together, get it all down, do your ordinance, do all this stuff where you have time, not a minute and a half to talk about it. Here, here. This isn't good board policy to come here in front of people that, and there's a lot of people here that are very concerned about this. And then you guys just sit up here and you don't have the answers. I have a lot of respect for Mr. Watts. He brings Mr. up very good do questions. Do you have any more comments about the form itself and not Well, this form questions? is really about all that because that, this is showing you right there. Use the resources you have. Thank you. Mitch Allen, Lost Nation Road. We know you're under a lot of pressure to do something. And you admit that it's not a perfect ordinance as it is. I agree with that. There are the provisions that are very unpalatable to a good portion of our, our town. Uh, the people who favor it are the people who have nothing to lose. They don't, they're not shooters, gun owners, etc. So they have nothing to lose. The burden is placed on the people who do enjoy that. The biggest stumbling block here is the registration. How does that enhance safety? What does it do? I know you got to do something, but doing something wrong is worse. It does not do anything to enhance safety. Um, insurance does nothing to do to enhance safety. How would that prevent somebody from getting reckless and careless. They figure they've got insurance, so don't worry. Um, I'd say throw out the registration business because that's, that's just rife with the possibilities of being abused down the road. Thank you. This gentleman is coming to speak at the mic, and we are speaking about a different business item. Once again, Evan Hughes, Vermont Federation of Sportsmen's Clubs. You're having a meeting, a discussion about a form on an ordinance you've tabled. 
That's completely illogical. The discussion of the form should take place after you've resolved the issue of the ordinance. You could have done what Colchester did, worked for them, wasn't all this, but you turned your back on doing what Colchester did. This municipality abuts Colchester. Why did they do the public safety perspective without all these problems? Because they didn't choose to go forward the way you are. Also with regard to insurance, you're not required to have insurance in your home. If you don't have a mortgage on your home, you're not required to have insurance. You're not required to have an insur insurance on a car if you don't drive it on the road. If you've got a car in your, in your garage, you're not required to have insurance on it. This whole, this whole thing that's caused this Donnybrook of public forum that you're seeing here could have been avoided had Essex Junction, Essex, gone the way of Colchester. Work for them, you don't hear all this fighting, and it could have worked for you. Anybody else, sir? Okay. Chris Adams, Browns River Road. I just want to say really quickly that, uh, you know, the words that we use are, you know, sometimes they're just semantics. But, you know, if I, if I decide to fill one of these out, put my name on it, sign it, and my wife's information as well, you know, we, we make a transformation from occasionally, infrequently, safely shooting weapons on our land to having a shooting range on our property. And those are, there's a huge dichotomy there, dichotomy there. And I think there's no gradation here. There's no spectrum. There's nothing. It's either, either you do not fire weapons on your land other than hunting or you have a shooting range on your property. And some people do have ranges, but other people really don't. And it seems like we've, we're, you're creating a bit of a monster here that it's, it's kind of taking on a life of its own. I really would encourage you to take a step back and... And, and try not to fall into the hole of just doing something, even though that something may not be moving you in the direction you really want to go. I really would encourage you. This is, this is messy stuff, and I do give you credit for tackling it because the, the pressure is there. I get it. But please really think about it. And many of these points made here tonight are from people that are very passionate, but they're, they're really saying a lot of things that are very, very truthful. Um, and I encourage you to, to really think about it. Thank you. Thank you. I'm assuming you know who I am, but my name's Daryl Montague of Pettengill. Um, I'm going to simply ask you to remember one thing. It's called the KISS principle. Keep it stupidly simple. Okay. I'm going to reiterate everything Evan did in an effort of time. Mention no, and keep in mind your home, what you are, what's on you. It's private domain. What you do on there is up to you. It's already illegal to be shooting on your property and have the bullets leave your property. That's already illegal. That's already dangerous. Okay, we all, all of us that have a, a back barn yard range or a front yard range or whatever it might be already know that. It's the responsibility of the person that's, that's doing it to keep it on the range on the thing. If they're dangerous with it, that's, a, that's, that's its own issue. If the bullets are leaving the property, that's there. Insurance, whether, and again, you don't have to have your home insured. You don't have, why should I have to have the land insured? Okay? Insurance is a personal thing, not a thing. Keep it simple, stupid. Hello again, Ashton McEwen, 20 Upper Main. Again, I'm unequivocally opposed to having liability insurance. But I think one of the things you need to realize, as this gentleman pointed out, is you know, one of the things we do on our property is be conscientious of when you're shooting. And I know other people have, have talked about that today. Um, we don't shoot on a weekend, nice day. People might be out walking. You try and keep it. You know, during the day, during the week, kids are at school, people are at work. But like this gentleman pointed out, if I have a range that's registered and has liability, those nice days on Saturdays, 
I'm going to be shooting, as opposed to going down to LaBerge's, Shelburne. Because I'm not paying all that money to not shoot. Think about that, please. You've already spoken. I want to give everyone a, I want to give everyone a chance, sir. I need to give everyone a chance who hasn't spoken yet. Is there anybody else who has not spoken on the topic yet? Okay, thank you. And we're well aware of the possible changes on the hunting schedule. Thank you. Is there anyone else who hasn't spoken? All right. Thank you again for taking the time to share with us your thoughts. We realize how difficult this is. I appreciate your being here. We're gonna continue the discussion and then we have other business to take care of. So we're most likely gonna wrap this up in the next few minutes. Thank you again. Okay. So we've agreed to table the voting on the ordinance to, a spe uh, to September 23rd after a special meeting where we'll discuss the edits that were requested by board members. We need to finish discussion on the form. And uh, in the spirit of compromise and in the spirit of listening to the public, Max and Pat, I would like you to consider striking the liability insurance requirement from the form. Uh, Andy and then Max. What I was shy to say before is that my concern with the liability insurance is it gives the form a feeling that something needs to be insured when what we're asking people to do is form a bond of trust between those. So I feel that removing, like you're asking, is appropriate because when there's liability insurance, you're, it's almost like you're saying that it's incorrect what you're doing when what you're doing is something that you're doing for good and safely and on purpose. Does that make sense? Am I making mm -hmm. sense? Yep. So I agree with you and I do ask the same. Is that okay that I said it like that? Absolutely. Uh -huh. Max, you had your hand up. Yeah. Um, it took us 10 years to update the imperfect firearms ordinance. And it's, as I said, it's still imperfect. Um, I'd like to actually take a step back further than just the liability piece. Um, the form is imperfect. We're trying to do the right thing, but it sounds like they know a better way, perhaps, to be able to come to that. Um, I don't want to have a form out there that, we, that doesn't really do anything, and I don't know if it really does what we had hoped to do. I'd like us to consider, I know in the ordinance there's a date at which the form would become active. I'm wondering if, again, it took us 10 years to update the firearms ordinance. We kind of just started working on this form, really. I'd like to give it the same respect and time to maybe push that out so that we can have a better way to get uh, a system that, uh, again, with, with the, there's an incredible resource in our community that I think would be willing to work with us to come up with something that will address the public safety that we're trying to do. And um, I'd like to consider, or at least have the board consider, postponing the implementation of the form until we can give it a little bit more time. Um, majority of the <coughs> folks out there that have these are exactly what they say. They're, they're, they're doing it safely. It's those that aren't that we really are most concerned about. And I'd like to hear from these experts who know how to do it correctly, how they can help us ensure that we have that whole family of ranges safe. Okay. So it's probably a surprise to you since I'm the one that started this form. <laughs> it is a surprise. I'm not saying we want to necessarily not do a form, but I'm saying I'd like to give it the respect it deserves and the time so perhaps we can address the ordinance you know that we talked about the way we are but have that date for implementing something like this postponed so that we can tap into that resource and come up with something that that's going to have the impact we're hoping it will and not just something 
um, that, that might not deliver what we're hoping. I just have to ask, we have had this conversation before. A couple meetings ago, Chief Gary suggested possibly the consideration of a task force. Yeah, I'm not talking about task force. Okay, so the task force that Chief recommended was, suggested was officials, police, and residents to whom this would apply. So what, are, what is the difference between that and what you're proposing? I'm thinking more like a listening tour to go out there to get, so we can come up with a, uh, an encyclopedia of ideas that are coming from those who know it better certainly than I do. That it's still the board that's gonna come up with what goes into this, but let's tap into that knowledge resource that is clearly out there. But it's not a task force. We're not, we're not delegating power to anybody else. It's gotta stay here. But I'd sure like to tap into that energy source to, to have us come, again, majority, I trust what I'm hearing, that are, do it safely. It's those, and they've even agreed that there's some out there that aren't. And those are the ones we wanna focus on. They may have ideas that they could give us a menu to choose from to come up with something. But I think the responsibility is with us, not a task force. I'm just looking for more. Uh, I, we're trying to do the right thing. I wanna make sure we do the right thing. So would you, how would this apply to the shooting range amendments that we currently have on the table? Are you saying those would stay or they would not it, be in the ordinance and we would uh, explain well, what you mean in relation to that? Again, if the NRA guideline, and I know it's a thick book, but the, the shooting range piece is a, a piece of that. And that uh, discount or whatever, they, that, that uh, liability piece that they put in there, they do that to protect the, the NRA. But what they're saying is these are the guidelines. Um, and if those aren't the right guidelines for the type of ranges we have, maybe this information resource has a better way to have us define what those should be than this guidebook but, is all I'm saying. Okay. I'm sorry to, to throw that wrench at you, but I hear, uh, you know, I, I don't want to just do something. I want to do, I want to do something right, or at least as close to right as we can. Okay. Ian? I greatly appreciate all that Max has said. I have a concern is that I heard and was also feeling myself. Although, for speaking purposes, it did work that they were separate items. Because I think we got to hear more from people about their thoughts more, more fully in this regard. But I do think that moving forward, that these things need to be together. Because there's a lot of stress involved in hearing that an ordinance has passed that requires a form and then this limbo of wondering what the form is going to say. I think that this evening it was absolutely perfect because I feel, and I, I don't know why all the people left. We tried to say, we, I we said we're still discussing, but they couldn't hear us. Um, I think that this evening it worked in our favor that it was separate because I got a chance to hear people who were very angry the first time they got up. I got to see them in a different light the second time because they had come forward again and we're watching the interaction. So for this evening, I appreciate it. Moving forward, I'm concerned that they're separate because it causes anxiety and unsurety. So I think your question was a good one and I hear what you're saying and I'm gonna add one more layer to this is that I'm a little intrigued task force committee-wise because we have an energy committee. We have, we have committees for, for other things and so part of me is like, well, yeah, I know, I, I see it, that I don't maybe know enough. That's not at all. Well, I, 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 I want to make sure that I'm respectful of the work that's been done by people who have sat in this position before. And I want to make sure that I'm working together with the board and with the people all. I think, I think these things are obviously very important. And so I guess I'm going to get a little bit more pushy and that I think that the form needs to live with the ordinance or we piece that out but that doesn't that makes me a little nervous if we piece that out and then we that makes me nervous that we're not going to cover the whole thing just a response to that mm -hmm. particular piece in general the form is not part of the ordinance because forms can change yes so if we have this exact form in an ordinance then 
anytime we want to change a single line on it, whether it's administrative oh, for or anything, future. we have to go through the whole ordinance hearing process. And so, so even if we want to remove something from it, let's right. say we found out. Sure. Right. So, but this applies to things like dog license applications and, and like any kind of paperwork that the town uses. Well, if we all went through the ordinance process, it would not. It's a standard practice, but I understand your concern, and I understand that this particular form is, is very laden with, with um, significance and we need to pay special attention so to may, it. So maybe it, is, so maybe it is appropriate that it stay with it, even though it's going to make it more difficult to remove pieces that, we, that people don't like, as well as we can, we can take that under consideration uh -huh. as we move forward. Andy and Pat, your thoughts about Max's suggestion? I'm, I'm in favor of it, of it. I would like to, what I would like to do though is, is separate the two pieces, do two different ordinance updates so that we, we are doing the parks part of it on the schedule that we originally intended to do it, to, to close that in September and, and strike the shooting range section for, for consideration in a separate ordinance update once we know what's gonna be on the form. I'm 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 very concerned. You know, I think Andy said it too. Is the you got and I know you, you rebutted it, but it specifies a form. But if we don't know what the form is, or if we can't ever come to agreement on the form, how, how, you know, we're we're still going to have to go through a process to remove the requirement for the form if we don't get there. So I you know, I'd like to separate the two, uh, close the parks and the hunting question, and continue discussing the shooting range. Good idea. Huh? Uh, I mean, I have no problem myself dealing with the form separately because, I mean, we do this in lots of different things. Forms do change. I do hear what you're saying, but it's a positive as well as a negative. Uh, the form itself is, is generally less robust than the full process of the ordinance. Not always, but in large part. Um, as far as the stepping back idea, um, I'm not really sure where we are, insurance, stepping back, or what the feel for the board is going to be. What I think is difficult and that a lot of people sort of don't get is that a task force itself, if we set that up under the umbrella of the town and we go out, we're not legally allowed to say, hey, you know what, this works. It doesn't matter how much of an expert you guys are or how much of an expert I am we are not allowed we cannot go out there and say this looks good because then the town puts its stamp of approval on whatever you've built no matter how safe it is and, that was and the even if there's an accident or a problem then the town itself is liable and all of us as taxpayers are liable it's not that we don't think that the people who are coming to us know way more about this than we do we agree what we need to do is come up with a way where we you know and I think that's why it was kind of discounted as an idea before, is that if we set this up as a task force, or if we set up a knowledge base where you guys are coming to us and saying, this is what it should be, one, two, three, the second we say, yeah, that looks great, the town is liable. And we can get sued. And we're just not able to go forward on that path. As a select board, we can't move forward and during a path that opens us up to liability. So, I mean, I think that's probably why the previous police chief said just make Essex a no shooting town because you want to keep it simple stupid. That's the simplest thing. What we're trying to do is come up with a middle ground here, a compromise, and I'm not sure necessarily where that lands. It doesn't sound like the board knows where that lands, but just be aware that we have heard this there's reasons why we haven't gone down some of these other routes. It's because we're just not able to. And it sucks. But that's the truth. So in a lot of cases, yeah, that's what happens. We something gets passed, yeah. So I might need some parliamentary advice here. We have a proposal to we have two proposals which we should consider separately, but they're related. Sure. Andy's proposal is that we strip section 6.08.045 from the amendment, amended ordinance that we tabled earlier today. I don't know if, because we've already tabled it, 
can we pick it back up right now? Because we didn't set a date. We said to be determined when we would table it. I would wait until the special meeting. Yeah. Um, Do it at the special meeting. Okay. Discuss it then, and then you can vote to warn a certain portion of the ordinance to go forward. Or could we warn an amended ordinance that just strikes that section out? Would that be the more appropriate if we were to go that way? Well, if you're going to warn a meeting, it's to talk about the ordinance. You don't have to be specific okay. of what you're going to do. Because at that meeting, you may decide to do something more or less. It is important that we take some steps now, or at least this, this fall within the next couple months. We, there appears to be consensus of the board on the date range, and there appears to be consensus on the board for the Indian Brook, Saxon Hill, and Tree Farm mm -hmm. um, discharge bans. Yes, Annie? Will you clarify what you mean by date range? November 1st to December 15th, the uh -huh. time when you're able to hunt within Indian Brook, Saxon Hill, and Saxon Hill. So there seems to be consensus about those two things. And the related definitions that appear in the amended yes. ordinance. Would that be an accurate statement? Annie? I'm hearing you, if I'm understanding you properly, which is what I want to make sure I am, and I know we're all tired. I'm sorry mm -hmm. to be difficult. You are saying that we're all in agreement for the date ranges. Am I understanding correctly that if we learn about new dates that we are open to amending and changing? We don't know what they are or if they're official. So because we don't know, we have to be with what we have now. Right. Uh -huh. We can always yes. discuss at a future Understood. time when we have definite so then, information. Yes, agree that. So. In light of Max's suggestion that we reach further out to the community than we already have and bring in some f additional consultation that we consider at the next special meeting that we've decided we're going to have that we discuss amending the ordinance further to not include the shooting or shooting ranges portion and go ahead and approve the ordinance with the changes related to Indian Brook at Saxon Hill and the tree farm. Would that be the consensus of the board? I agree with that. As long as we do deal in the near future or continue the discussion on the shooting range yes, side. Yes, absolutely. With, okay. I wanted to break it up a while back, uh, so I'm fine with doing it that way. Madam Chair. Yes. This discussion is on the form. Yes, thank you. The other item was tabled. That's a good point. Yes. All right. <laughs> so based on this discussion, which we just had, it sounds like we're tabling the form as well. Would that be accurate? Mm -hmm. But maybe point of order. Yes. If you're going to do that, which it's fine if you do, before you table, can you please give staff some guidance on what you might want us to review and get information of for when you we. Uh, when you meet again on the topic. Yes, yes. Thank you. Yes. So what I'd like to do then, we, we already have a list of the information that we want the staff to re research regarding the ordinance itself. We've already asked them for that. You guys have those three items. On the form, let me get back on there. Where is that? That is D. We are proposing that we table the form until we can have a deeper discussion with the community about shooting ranges in general. Is that what you're proposing? Yeah, to come up, if, if our concern is uh, to address public safety regarding um, shooting ranges, mm -hmm. are there resources out there, and it sounds like there are, how do we, how can we tap into those? I'm not talking task force, but at least from a more educational piece so that we can then come up with something that sounds like based on it, real information from people who are in the know, uh, addresses what we really want to address. So are we asking staff to come, yes, Andy? I think you're gonna say what I'm saying. Are thinking. we asking staff to come up with an outreach plan? Or are we recommending an outreach plan? What is your pleasure? 
I guess for them to consider what, what that might look like, an outreach plan. And it doesn't have to be in two weeks or a month, but it's something that I'd like to make sure we have work on, that we work on going forward, as we did 10 years on this other ordinance, to come up with a place that, again, we hear people say, we didn't go far enough, we went too far, people saying it's good. That sounds like we probably got it about right. I'd like to give the same opportunity to the shooting ranges, whether it's a form or not, I don't know, it depends on the input. So then what we can be directing staff to do, in, in lieu of approving a form tonight, we can instead say, staff, please provide the board at its next meeting, the special meeting about the gun ordinances, to make some suggestions of possible outreach opportunities to discuss the shooting ranges um, specifically. If they're able to do it, and that's sure if If they're able right, to start, right. that would be awesome. Okay. Is, is that sufficient? Is that enough detail? It's really not a lot, but it's, it's a little bit of direction. <laughs> Better than I had two minutes ago. Okay. Uh, yes, I, I'd say so. And it, it uh, sure. I, I will highlight yeah. if there's enough time. Yeah. For the, before the special meeting to come up with an outreach plan. Absolutely. Yeah, I personally don't think it's a requirement to have it ready for that discussion. I think that discussion for the special meeting could be specific to the ordinance. And then we could have yeah. something specific to the shooting range at some time at in, the, in the future. At a future time. Okay. That's just me speaking. I'm just one of five. So. Annie, you look like you were getting ready to say something. I, I, the one thing I do want to say is that I wanted to ask that people who come to our meetings see and understand that we are listening and hearing. It is uncomfortable at best to have threats yelled out. Like it's, it's uh, we're hearing you, we're listening to you so sincerely. Uh, uh, I want to do what's right. Please, uh, sorry. Understand that we are sincere in our efforts. I, uh, they would be greatly appreciated, thank you. Thank you, Annie. Okay, so regarding this form, sounds like we're ready to table it. Would anyone like to move to table? I would like to move to table, if I can get it correctly. And please, someone stop me and jump in if I get it wrong. I move to table the discussion of the notification form. There you go. That's it? Yep. I Would second. anyone like to second? I'll Max. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Thank you. Before you all leave, please keep in mind what Annie just said. And please keep in mind the significant shift we just took at your behest. We have been listening the whole time. And most of the time, it's you guys that have been in the audience, not people who are in favor of what we're trying to do. So we've had a lot of one-sided feedback for a very long time. But we still have to address both sides. And we still have to address well, let me take that back. We are trying to do something that addresses the concerns and balances the concerns of everybody in the room when we could do the simplest thing, which was recommended by three separate police chiefs, which is to just make Essex a no discharge town. We're trying to save what is important to you and we're trying to keep what's important to others. Please keep that in mind. The personal remarks and the threats of lawsuits are just not necessary. We're doing our best, and we know you are as well. So thank you for being here and doing this consistent, informed engagement. We need it, we want it, we thank you for it. And now we're gonna move on to other business, and please go home to your air conditioning. <laughs> <laughs> or stay, or stay with us. And for those of you who are still on the agenda, thank you for waiting. Hey, Jeff. Thank you.
It's okay. It's it's an important issue. We all get worked up. You're fine. You don't need to apologize for this. Thank you very much, and you do realize that we're ahead of you both on this and for the rest of the evening. Thank you. We haven't even started talking about dogs. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All oh, even even people who are passionate, it's, it's okay. <laughs> I know. We'll talk later. It's okay. Okay. We were the last two business items. We're going to do one before the other because there is people in the audience waiting patiently. <laughs> um, <laughs> We moved earlier for item 6G, the Energy Commission, regarding the electric bus program. They're still here. Oh. Come on down. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Thank you for lasting the whole time. Oh, oh, we, we will try to hit the reset button as oh, best we can. Wow. You guys are amazing. Wow. <laughs> but, so this is an entirely different topic from what you were talking about before. And to try to summarize it, so one of the things that the energy, by the way, my name is Will Dodge, I'm the chair of the Energy Committee. One of the tasks that the Energy Committee has in its charter is to look at ways at ultimately saving the town money, and that includes the, the Essex Westford School District, as well as trying to achieve renewable energy, reduce our greenhouse gas footprint. And recently, the, this select board passed an enhanced energy plan that had two specific items in it that I'll just read as sort of goals for dealing with transportation. And just to preface that, of all the ways that we ultimately try to reach 90% renewable by 2050, or if you prefer, reducing our overall greenhouse gas footprint, transportation is one of the most difficult. We've done, sort of collectively in the town, a lot has been done on the electrical side. There's a lot of work being done on the heat side. So in other words, we have more renewable generation, we have more weatherizations. But the toughest problem by far on this whole issue of how do we become more renewable, how do we deal with green gas, gases, is transportation. So there's two goals in the enhanced plan, which says, I think it's number nine, lead by example by replacing the town's vehicle fleet with electric or biodiesel fuel vehicles as fossil fuel burning vehicles reach the end of their useful life. Now you'll notice that doesn't say anything about the school district, but I'll just keep going. Number 11 says work with the school district to maximize ridership for public school buses and minimize use of private vehicles for student transport, but it goes on to talk about explore working with a bus company who is converting its bus fleet to electric. So very shortly after you guys passed the enhanced energy plan, we had something that kind of falls right in between those two goals. And that is, as a result of the Volkswagen diesel fraud settlement, uh, state money, it's not, we're not entitled to it, we have to work for it, that can go toward a pilot project at qualifying school districts where the school works with a private bus company, basically like what we have in Essex, where those Volkswagen funds would be used to both create all the charging infrastructure necessary to have two or three buses or more, and also purchase the buses if we have buses that are at the end of their useful life. So the way that we approached this issue is first, we obviously reached out to the school district. We made them know of the offer. And like a lot of municipal employees, and I know I've spoken with Greg and Evan about this, it's one thing for us to come in as the cheerleaders and say, hey, here's a great offer that you can take advantage of. And it's another thing for, a municipal employee or a school district employee to take the time to be able to put everything else off of their schedule and focus on that issue. So at first it seemed like um, uh, Jamie Smith, who's the transportation director, she had a lot of on her plate. She had uh, dealing... He, he, he. Uh, sorry, yeah. What did I say? He. She. She. Uh, he, he. I'm so sorry. It's he. four hours in heat here already. Right. Exactly. So. It seemed like we weren't going to be able to apply, but we kept talking about it, and I think there were discussions within the school district, and they said, let's go for it, let's submit an application to see if we can be one of the uh, people to benefit from that pilot program. So when you look at the pilot program criteria, among the various elements are support of the community for taking advantage of the pilot project. So the reason that we're here taking up more oxygen than's already been taken up 
is to see if the select board would support a resolution of support for the application that we would then submit or supplement uh, the application. So I sent out that draft. I'm not sure if you want me to read the whole thing or if it makes sense to talk about it. There were a couple typos in it. There was, it was definitely late last night. And all of this is coming to a head very quickly, but we really appreciate the fact that the staff put this on because the fast, you know, what, what, I, what I explained in the email is, this is a building block. This is, you know, changing over to electric school buses through Essex is not likely to happen on, without a program like this. Maybe it'll be that suddenly the fleets will start changing over. Certainly when you look around Essex, you can see a lot more volts, a lot more bolts, Leafs, Teslas over the past three years than certainly there were before that. And that's great. That's showing that the passenger vehicle side of the transportation pro uh, problem is getting addressed. But the much larger vehicles to have a chance to make those electric and to save a lot of the costs, as I've outlined, I think over the life of, of an electric bus, you would basically save about $36,000 or 60% of the total that you would spend on a diesel bus and you'd be reducing the footprint of that bus in terms of fossil fuels by about 97%. So it's a great, and I don't know if any of you have ever ridden on those electric buses. I have. Honestly, they're indistinguishable from a regular old school bus, except they're a lot cleaner because they're new. But apart from that, they, they run great. They're comfortable. There's nothing really all that newfangled about them except that they don't require as many fluids, the, they're more reliable, and they've got batteries that can basically go between 60 and 70 miles or be fitted to go up to 150 miles. So I'm not sure if there's any questions or... Yeah, so Will, oh, I'm sorry. Um, you, your application deadline was August 16th, so you've already applied to VEIC? The school district has applied to VEIC, but my theory of the case is we can still supplement the application because they knew perfectly well that um, that this was all kind of being rushed and that it needed to go quickly because of the how the settlement is structured. But there's also even language in here that says either show us that you have community support or explain your plan for building that. So part of this is to get the community support in. And then I think it'll be up to us as an Essex energy committee to try to build upon what you do and what the school district has done to seek further support in the community. Okay. Next. If this um, pilot program um, gets funded, I mean, is there a cost to the, the municipality? There is no cost for the, just that portion of the program. So we're in just words, saying we support the idea of doing this, but there's no cost that's correct. In other words, the idea is to take advantage of the fact that the school district qualifies in order to get those funds. Now, to the degree that the school district decides to do more than just accepting whatever comes through the program, we've actually been, the committee has been working on ways of trying to find out how do we leverage money generally on some of these bigger projects. A really important one is the fact that Vermont Electric Cooperative which basically has as its territory sort of the northern third of Essex, has a community fund program right now, and they are trying to find qualifying projects. There's no question in my mind that helping kids who are in that part of Essex get to school on an electric school bus will qualify and will fit into their what are called T tier three requirements. So, but, but out of the gate, there's, there's nothing being asked for of the town by way of money. If we approve this, then there's, we're not putting money up. Correct. We're just basically helping the school district grab money that's out there that we otherwise would never see. Cool. I, I have two school bus questions. Uh, are they quieter? Yes. And In fact, they have the special feature, just to answer because it's a great question. I'm excited about the, it. They have the special feature where because they don't have motor noise, yeah. they have a special little song that plays when the bus backs up oh, or really? puts yeah. a stop on oh, that it's just a digital and you can hear it outside very clearly and so that that's the substitute for the engine that you would otherwise hear Great. and then my second question is you know when a school bus goes uphill and there's that moment there's that moment where it's and then it's got to kick in a bit and it revs what does an electric school bus do at that moment do you know 
From what, I've, from what I've seen with, and this is from my own experience driving electric vehicles for years and years, you really can't tell the difference except that on a, on a steep hill, yeah. there's often more torque. Really? When you're pushing it, when you really, you know, if you, so what would be a good example? You know, if you were driving up um, Pearl Street, yeah. you know, it's gonna have a greater ability to accelerate more quickly up yeah. that hill. And the other thing is, um, and I think, I think this is true, we've sort of pulled people through the committee about this. You'd think that there would be a lot of trouble in winter, and it's certainly true that the battery life does not go quite as far in the winter as it goes in the summer, but it's not enough to really make a difference as far as that 60 or 70 miles go, and no one really has pro any more problems in snow with an electric vehicle than with You're a they don't. conventional. They don't. Yeah, this, is, this is exciting. Thanks for that information. Andy. Do you know how far a typical school bus travels in a day? Um, it's, it is, it's in the literature, but I think it's, it's basically in the, it obviously depends if they're going on a school trip and what is the route. So what I'd anticipate from this is that the electric bus might be used for some of the shorter routes unless it's fitted with the extra batteries. But certainly it's, uh, the other idea that's expressed in here is in all of the literature, is that you know you can have the bus do its route if you've got the right charging infrastructure during the times when the kids are at school it's charging basically waiting with a supercharger to be completely ready to go by the time school comes out and that there actually might be good reasons to you know to charge during that time period that time frame depending on the time of year and all kinds of other considerations I apologize because I'm going to get very specific. Um, I'm on the school board as well, so I haven't seen any of this come through to us yet. Um, but I did have questions primarily about, I mean, I would be absolutely for this if Essex Westford gets the electric school bus. We do have some of them, but by and large, Essex Westford contracts out with Mountain Transit. Right. And Mountain Transit uh -huh. is very large, and they would – if they get this bus, they don't necessarily have to use it in our district. Theoretically, would this then belong to Mountain Transit? I believe that they do based on the guidelines that I read because if you, if you look, there's two sets of guidelines. One is for the school district and the second is for the bus company that it's, it's assumed under the pilot program that the uh -huh. school district is working yeah, with. Yeah, So in other words, yeah, no, it's, and it's- So I haven't had time to like- It's not, to, it's, it's definitely, I, I also thought about that issue, but from what I can understand, it's basically, it's a pilot in part because if the school district and the bus company are, meet the eligibility requirements, then they are required to use that bus for that particular district school itself. district. But it's, yeah, a great, that it's a great was, question. Right, yeah, that was my, I mean, like I said, I mean, I'm absolutely for electric vehicles, anything that we can do to get more buses off the road. I just didn't want us to be in a situation where we're approving a for-profit business to get a free electric right. bus. You know, it's just. <clears throat> Any other questions? No, honestly, I think the rest of my questions I'll save for Jamie the next time I see him. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you very much. Yeah, well, thank you. So, Will, you're looking for us to pass this resolution? Yes, or something approximating it, or <laughs> however you'd like to. Now, Keeping in mind this, this was drafted very quickly last night, but trying to, to at least put the pertinent information about why we are um, selecting this. I, and and you, how soon? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, no, go ahead. How I'm soon? Like, I, you're wanting us to do this tonight. No, you can do it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. So. Um, In front of a very large crowd. That's true. A lot of evidence there. Um, so great. If you have, unless Annie, you have more questions. I, I'm a little shy of how many words are here, and then I'm going to be like, sure, because I want to say yes for the bus, but the, the specifics of this. Would it be, oh, Evan? Can we find a way? Say, uh, looking for a motion to approve the Energy Committee uh, application for uh, resolution uh, for their application uh, for an electric bus. It's 
simple. Yes, you could, in theory, if you want to, you else. could take, you could use the last three paragraphs, yes. and that would basically accomplish. I feel much better because sure. I don't know enough to agree to those very specific details. Yes, and okay. just so that you know, you know, we weren't trying to pull the wool over. It was more we were taking the rest of that info from the from the FAQ itself, but yes, it's I, fine to. I think for what we need okay. to have those last three. three. Yeah. So actually, um, Pat, as our clerk, would you be willing to make the motion with the last three paragraphs? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I move, make sure I have this correctly. Um, trying to think of how to phrase the last three paragraphs, starting with August 16th. Where, just, just read whereas down. I mean, yeah. Uh, whereas on August 16th, 2019, with the support of the Energy Committee, the Essex Westford School District applied to the Vermont Energy Investment Corporation, RFQ, to participate in the pilot, whereas the select board supports the efforts of EWSD, I'm assuming, yes, <laughs> and the Energy Committee in pursuing the pilot program. Now, therefore, the town of the Essex select board supports the application for participation in the pilot program to Vermont Energy Investment Corporation to evaluate the feasibility and cost effectiveness of electric school and transit bus operation in Essex over a two year period. Okay, thank you. Second. Max is gonna second. Any further discussion? Annie? I just wanna say, I did not think you were trying to pull any wool. I just <laughs> wanted to make sure that I agreed with something that got us the situation, but I didn't have enough I didn't feel that I had enough confidence to do so. Understood. Thanks, Elaine, for that. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank well, you very much. Thank we you. We really have do a, we're it. very lucky. We have a very innovative and proactive energy committee. Well, we we sit through three hours. Thank it's you it's so great, much. and and I will give you some reports on some other things that we're doing. But this is this is really helpful, and it's, it's up to deal. us. Yeah, thank to you run for, from for there. getting us involved in it. Okay. And well thanks done. for waiting all night. Yes, thank you <laughs> Sorry, for that man. so much. <laughs> okay, um, item six C. Designating a voting delegate for the VLCT annual business meeting. And in the past, we have ha been amply represented. Andy, please go ahead. I'm going to volunteer to represent the select board as a voting delegate for the VLCT business meet, annual business meeting. And you've done that how many years now? Well, I didn't do it last year because I was available. Mike Plagman did it. But uh, I think I've done it for four or five years before that. That's great. Anybody else? Wishing to contest or, or you know <laughs> challenge Andy for the role if, of if I, yeah, should we have a backup else? in case like what happened last year and you um, can't go and uh, Mike did you? I already I already have the day scheduled off so but if you got in case you okay. get hit by an electric oh. bus I guess oh. we can deal with it, <laughs> if it I happens. think if there's a backup they assign one I'd be happy to do the backup because I'm going anyway yeah so that's fine okay that's fine okay yeah any other questions or comments regarding this. Thank Andy for being Andy. willing to do it. I, I'd like to make a motion. Okay. Is that, is that how you do it? It's time. I'd like to make a motion to, not nominate, appoint. but appoint Andy Watts to represent the town. Represent the town at the VLCT annual business meeting. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? Andy? <laughs> I'd like to I'd like to uh, register for the the conference that goes along with that too. Oh, it's uh, two days in Killington. Yeah. Yeah. If anybody else wants to register, let me know and we can sign you up. I'm happy having Andy represent. Yeah. I'm I'd, exactly I'd like you to excited register. about it. It's That's great. why I have the two days scheduled off because it's in Killington this year. Okay. <laughs> okay. Any further discussion? All in favor of nominating Andy to represent us at the VLCT annual business meeting, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Thank you, Andy. Item 6F is an executive session for discussion of legal matter. It's not a pressing item. I'd like to suggest that we just not do it tonight and do it at, the, at another meeting. If we'd like to have some more. Is that okay with staff? Is that okay with staff if we? We suggested it. Yeah, they told me to, 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 postpone. I, they told me awesome. to do that. I also, I, do, I prefer when we have the ability to go into an appropriate room. It makes me a little shy to have, so yes, I, okay. I'm All right. to, to talk so long to say that. 
He needs a motion. It's just uh, an update. Yeah. So can I have a motion to table the executive session on a legal matter? So moved. A second? Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> okay, consent agenda. Now I understand there might be a correction, Andy. Yeah, I'd like to pull out the meeting minutes. I'd like to make a correction and that's a significant change to one sentence. So Andy has made a motion to pull the minutes of August 5th out of the consent agenda. Can we have a second? A second. Andy seconds. All those in favor of, of pulling the minutes of August 5th out of the consent agenda signify by saying aye. 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 Okay, Andy, what's your pleasure? Okay, line 160 um, starts with Mr. Watts clarify that this statement would not rule out, it should sit, that the word not should be struck. No. Oh. That's it. Line 160, you said? 160. It's not grammatical. That's <laughs> it's really just completely the opposite thing. Right, right. Okay. Although I'm sure it's very difficult to keep up with everything. I didn't mean to be. Rude. Were there any other corrections to these nope. minutes? That's it. Okay. That's it. We have a motion to approve the minutes as amended. I make a motion to approve the minutes as amended. Second. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And what's left on the consent agenda are the check warrants. Can there be a motion to approve? I move approval of the check warrants with select board member, or the uh, consent agenda, remaining consent agenda with select board member. Right, right. Item 7B. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, we've done it. <laughs> we got through all of the it's items. It's only 10.30. Uh, the reading files, select board comments. Anybody have any comments or questions or things to discuss? Annie? Oh, not in the reading file. Okay. Okay. Well, oh, select board comments is for, yeah, it's oh, for whatever. Uh, I do suggest that Elaine, if it's possible, to contact the two news agencies and let them know about the extra piece that they did not hear. But I don't know if that, I think it's a, a piece that's important to the discussion and that, um, is warrant, uh, it, it, it needs to be said if, it, if you have time and it's possible before they air in uh, Well, they, they air. <laughs> I'm happy to help you get that phone call to the right person. You know, I, I have to say it's not pra common practice to do oh, that. then in which um, case. Right, right. What they're gonna do is say, you know, Whatever at the time say. of this report, okay. they were still delivering. Right. I don't think they're gonna say, sure. you know. All right, then. I, I don't even know where to begin. I would try, but. It's okay. I, I'm probably overthinking it. I'm happy to contact them tomorrow sure. and tell them the results of the meeting. Sure. That we can certainly do. Sure. Okay. Thanks. Anything else? Andy? On the meeting schedule, we have joint meetings on the 27th and on the 9th. Do we have enough content to have both of those meetings? Just we do. Okay. <laughs> yeah, just, just asking because we canceled one recently. So. We're always on the lookout for ways to not have to do Tuesday nights are much harder for me than Mondays. But Remember Killington. I'll be there. I'm just kidding. Thank you, Andy. Any other comments? Sounds like it's time to adjourn. Would anyone like to move? So moved. Second. All in favor of adjourning? Aye. Aye. Aye.